ESPN2 Primetime College Football is broadcast in high definition, presented by Pioneer Plasma. The undefeated Louisville Cardinals hit the road to the Music City. The eighth-ranked cards are in Nashville tonight to play Middle Tennessee. Brian Brown will not be starting at quarterback once again. It'll be Hunter Kentwell making his fourth start. Still the Cardinals' number one of the country in scoring. It'll be on display tonight. For most programs, losing a pair of Heisman candidates would spell disaster. But Bobby Petrino... ESPN2 Primetime College Football is broadcast in high definition, presented by Pioneer Plasma. The undefeated Louisville Cardinals hit the road to the Music City. The eighth-ranked cards are in Nashville tonight to play Middle Tennessee. Brian Brown will not be starting at quarterback once again. It'll be Hunter Kentwell making his fourth start. Still the Cardinals' number one of the country in scoring. It'll be on display tonight. For most programs, losing a pair of Heisman candidates would spell disaster. But Bobby Petrino's Louisville Cardinals have simply reloaded. It doesn't matter if it's Brown or Cantwell. They're going after it. The offense is still rolling. And the Cardinals' defense is now rocking. Do the Cardinals have what it takes on both sides of the ball to go undefeated? The quest continues next. Welcome to Nashville, Tennessee, and LP Field, home of the NFL's Tennessee Titans, and tonight, home of the top scoring offense in college football in the Louisville Cardinals. Hi everybody, I'm Dave Pash, Trevor Maddich, Rod Gilmore, Heather Cox will be alongside shortly. Well, Louisville, as we mentioned, number one in the country in scoring, number two in total offense, fifth in rushing, and number one in rushing touchdown scores. But fellas, if you ask the Louisville coaches, they ain't happy, and I don't understand why. 700 yards on average in the first two games in total offense, less than 400 in the last two games. For a lot of teams, that's still pretty good. Well, yeah, how can you be unhappy with that? That's kind of like being married to Halle Berry and then wishing she would lose weight. This still remains, even without Braun, the most explosive offense in the country. Hunter Cantwell has a very accurate, strong arm. But if there's a weakness, it's that he is inexperienced at the most important aspect of the operation, which is reading the defense pre-snap and making checks at the line in their fast tempo. The question is, Rod, does that inexperience give Middle Tennessee a chance? I don't know. Middle Tennessee is in a for a tough night. It's a tough deal for them. But if they have any shot at all tonight, it's going to be about their defense. They have to get after quarterback Hunter Cantwell. Well, they have to hit him. They have to rattle him and shake his confidence. And they have the defense that can do that because they are a pressure defense. A lot of blitzing. There you see 11th and yards allowed. They have 14 sacks already on the season, 50 tackles for losses. It's a small defense, Dave Pash, but it's a very quick one and aggressive. They can get after the quarterback. And if for some reason Middle Tennessee should win tonight, Trevor and Rod promise to get along for the rest of the season. <laughs> All right, guys, Louisville comes into this game number one in scoring offense, and the Cardinals look to go 5-0 for the first time since 1993. They beat Middle Tennessee in Nashville next. In Nashville, Louisville trying to stay perfect on the year, taking on Middle Tennessee here at LP Field. Two of the top offensive players in college football will not be in the lineup tonight for the Cardinals once again. Quarterback Brian Brom suffering a thumb injury against Miami. He's due back in a couple of weeks, possibly even next week against Cincinnati. Michael Bush, however, will not return. He is out for the year with a broken leg. Earlier today, Brian Brom caught up with our Heather Cox. Brian, you had your cast removed this week. You're going to start throwing on Tuesday. There have been a lot of rumors out there. When do you expect to return to the field? We're going to give it a shot for the Cincinnati game and going to come out uh, Monday, actually, and put a splint on my finger. We're going to tape it up, uh, see how it feels, see if it's strong enough to, to go for this week. In your place, Hunter Cantwell has been taking the snaps. What's impressed you the most about his play so far? 
Hunter's been doing a great job of just running the offense that you know coach has. This offense is geared towards the quarterback to make it successful. He's going out there not trying to do too much and just letting the offense work for him and doing a great job. Not only have you been out, but the running back star Michael Bush is out for the season with a broken leg. How do you think this team has been able to compensate for the loss of two Heisman candidates? <laughs> You know, it's unfortunate that both of us are out right now, and it's really unfortunate that Mike's out for the season. But uh, everyone's just stepped up their game that much more, and just, you know, every game they know they have to pick it up that much more to make up for, you know, guys being out. And we try to do that with me, and just you know, pick up our game so we can take the place of those guys. Brian, we wish you a speedy recovery. And filling in for Brian Brom, as we mentioned at the outset of the telecast, Hunter Cantwell. He's one of our impact players, along with the two men, George Stripling and Colby Smith, who'll be trying to get it done at running back for the injured Michael Bush. Yeah, and Colby Smith is very solid. Stripling, he's the guy to keep your eye on. He's got blazing speed. That's a new dimension to this offense that they didn't have with Bush. This guy can go all the way right now. Louisville will start with the football, so we'll get a look early on at this potent Cardinal offense, which according to the coaches has struggled the last couple of weeks. Trent Guy is back to receive the kick from Matt King. Latarius Thomas also deep for the Cardinals. And we're underway from Nashville. Short kick will be taken by Thomas, and he fumbled it. Thomas scoops it up. Out to the 20, into the 22-yard line. Louisville number two in total offense in college football, number one in scoring, and also has 17 rushing touchdowns this year. There's a penalty flag first before we get to the starting offense for the eighth rank cards. Not a good start for Middle Tennessee, a penalty on the opening kickoff. Now the Cardinals, even without Michael Bush, still have 17 rushing touchdowns, and Bush led the nation in scoring a year ago. Five yards, number eight. Yerudi and Harry Douglas, the guys on the outside, will try to come up with some uh, offense tonight for Louisville. Well, they are matchup problems for Middle Tennessee. Yerudi has about 6'6", six, 6'6 six, six, six and a half, and that's a big problem for the small corners for Middle Tennessee. Yerudi the leading receiver. Douglas had a career-high six catches against Kansas State. Hunter Kentwell struggled a bit in that game, but still managed to win handily 24-6. to six. Kentwell, a former walk-on, he is a sophomore. First down from the 27, and they'll keep it on the ground to start things off. And it's Colby Smith out to about the 30-yard line, only three yards. Sean Mosley on the tackle. An underrated Middle Tennessee defense, 11th in total defense, and their defensive line loves to rush the passer. They do, and that's all they're asked to do. It's small, but they compensate for that by being explosive and driving up the field playing the run on the way to the quarterback. Keep an eye on number 39, Marcus Brandon, very good player. And J.K. Sab, a linebacker, the leading tackler for this squad. On second down, Cantwell has a man wide open. Jimmy Riley with only a second catch of the season in the Middle Tennessee Territory. Jonathan Harris on the tackle. 24-yard gain on second and long. Uh, guys, one of the keys for Louisville this week has been to get the right tempo in their offense. They complained about the fact that they only scored 24 points against Kansas State and that they weren't in sync. They weren't moving quickly enough. They did turn it over on three straight possessions in the third quarter. That was one of the things that hurt the coaches this week. Brock Bowling in the backfield on first down to the 47-yard line. Kentwell hit and set back at the 48 by Tavares Jones, his fourth of the year. Trevor, it's one of the things we talked about. You can disrupt tempo if you have a pass rush. And this was a great pass rush, and Campbell doesn't expect it. Now, he'll be coming from here. That is the right side of the quarterback. Campbell should be able to see Jones as he comes through. But because he's looking to his left, the closing speed of Jones comes through and allows that sack. Second and 14, George Stripling into the game for the first time. He'll get it on the toss. Strickland with good speed, and he can't hit the corner. Got back to the original line of scrimmage. Marcus Brandon on the tackle, along with Trevor Jenkins, and it will be third down and long. And this uh, could be big for Middle Tennessee guys in terms of confidence. They can stop Louisville here on third and ten. Well, you know, they feel good about their run defense. They're a small defense, but they attack very well. It's getting into the passing game that's been a problem for those guys. It has. Even Oklahoma, Adrian Peterson, they held him to below his average, but they got burned deep down the field. Can't well. 
delivers a strike on third down and ten and a beautiful move and a first down for Harry Douglas. He picked up the necessary yardage to move the chains, but Douglas hobbling a bit as he runs back to the huddle and now out at the sideline. Now we mentioned Louisville's numbers this year. Terrific, even if the coaches aren't thrilled with what they've seen over the last two weeks. I think their reason for concern is that, you know, they've got the backup quarterback, they have backup running backs, and they want everything to run smoothly as it did early on in the season, but that hasn't been the case. Brian Brom could return against Cincinnati next week. Certainly should be ready for West Virginia next month. Here's Bullen, cuts it back, and down at the nine-yard line. The fullback, Brock Bullen, a big run on first down. Well, you think of Louisville as a finesse offense, but this is about as power as power offenses go. On the top of the screen, you've got three tight ends that lined up in the power formation, almost like a goal line formation, and they just road graded that lane for Bowen. 26-yard pickup, Bowen coming off a career day, 53 yards and a touchdown. He's a transfer from Illinois, and really an interesting story. We'll develop that as we go along. Put it to you this way, you don't want to make him mad. The toss and Smith has trouble handling it, and he is down at the line of scrimmage. No game, Sab on the tackle. And Trevor, you were talking about Louisville being a power running team and road grading this defense. Well, part of the problem for this defense, they're awfully small up front. They've got a 245 pound tackle. And there's, they're still believing as we look at what happened in the opening drive against Kansas State. And we're not seeing it again here. Louisville is so good at scripting in the beginning. Now they had problems with the kickoff against Kansas State. Had problems with the kickoff tonight. A much better starting field position tonight. At their 22 as opposed to the three against K-State last week. Play clock winding down on second and goal. Smith in trouble. Can't get away from the defender at the 13-yard line. Eric Walden on the stop. Kansas State number two in the country in tackles for a loss. There is a penalty marker on the field. Well, if you're Middle Tennessee, do you definitely take this penalty, or do you decline it? It would be third down and goal from about the 13 or 14. The play, holding on the offense, number 77. That penalty is declined. Third down. I think they want to get off the field. They want to limit them in downs here, so they want to decline the penalty and force a third down instead of moving them back and giving them two more shots. And I agree with that after they just picked up that third down at third and 12. And don't give them two shots at it now. You saw Bobby Petrino. Nine wins in each of his first three seasons at Louisville. He's already got four this year, trying to go 5-0. It would be the first time during his tenure. Kentwell gets away from one man, and then his pass incomplete. Chris Vaughn, the intended receiver, fourth down. And Rod, that shows that strategy of declining that penalty pays off. Kentwell can throw it into the end zone from where he is or from 10 yards deeper just as easily. By giving him one shot, now they've got to go for the field. Rick Stock's still got to be pleased that Art Carmody's on the field. They go, that means Louisville's attempting a field goal. He's hit 19 of his last 20. This will be a 31-yard try. And it's good. But a moral victory, certainly, for Middle Tennessee guys to hold the Cardinals to three. This is the first year for Rick Stock still at Middle Tennessee, a name familiar with a lot of people that follow college football at South Carolina played at Florida State under Bobby Bowden. I think the other thing that, that he's got to be very happy about, they got about three or four hits on the quarterback, Hunter Cantwell, on that drive. And that's part of the defensive plan to knock him around and rattle his confidence as much as possible. And the impact players for Stockdale, uh, Stockdale on offense, really the running game, or the wide receivers, Bobby Williams and uh, Jay Robinson, uh, both outstanding young players. Even though Robinson is playing in his first career game, they really are high on this kid. Uh, they are, and the reason they're high on Robinson and Williams as well is that they give Middle Tennessee the best opportunity to make a big play. Louisville's defense is very, very fast. Those are the two guys from Middle Tennessee that have a chance to make a play in space against that speed. There's Robinson, a separated shoulder, and training camp has kept him on the sideline, but he's expected to play a lot today for Middle Tennessee, which, by the way, has never defeated a top-ten team. 
Never defeated a ranked team. 0-10 against top 25 schools. Did lose in overtime to Missouri a few years ago. We, you say never, like they've been around for 100 years. Though. True, they've only been around in D1 for five years. That's how long the Sun Belt has been around. And they're 3-0 in Nashville, by the way. All those wins coming at Vanderbilt, including last season. Todd Flannery to boot it away. Philip Tanner and Damon Nixon back for Middle Tennessee. Short kick. It'll be Nixon at the 15. Pass the 20. Nixon at the 30. The kicker to beat. Nixon at the 40. At the 30. 20. 10. 5. Touchdown, Middle Tennessee. An 88-yard kickoff return for a touchdown by Damon Nixon. And Middle Tennessee takes an early lead. Colby Smith on for the extra point. It's 7-3, Blue Raiders. Rick Stockstill has done an amazing job turning this program around in many ways. We'll talk about that as we go along tonight here at Nashville. Second kickoff return for a touchdown allowed by Louisville this year. The first one was against Kentucky. Louisville ended up winning that game 59-28. But for now, Middle Tennessee has the lead on an 88-yard return for a score by Damon Nixon. If Bobby Petrino wasn't happy going into the game, how do you think he feels right now? <laughs> I think he's a little cranky. Thomas and Guy back to receive the kick. From Matt King. What a start here in Nashville. Shocking some 20,000 plus global fans. Trent Guy banged down to the 28 yard line. Good hit on special teams. Rod Taylor with the stick. Let's go back to the touchdown. Look how the Louisville players were out of their lanes, and Nixon found it, and this opened up for him right there. Two spaces where the lanes just collapsed for Louisville, and Nixon had the great vision to find it and the burst of speed to get in and out. You see him running his flat now. He sees that lane because of the Louisville players running out of their lanes, and he hits it in full stride. First down of the Louisville 29, Colby Smith in the backfield. Cantwell going to him out of the backfield. And another drop, the second drop pass today by a Louisville receiver. The Rock, you're Middle Tennessee. You're going against the most explosive offense in the nation. And all of a sudden, you've got to leave five minutes into the game and your crowd is on their feet and excited. And every time Louisville drops a pass like that or has a holding penalty like the drive before, it makes them frustrated and keeps your crowd in the game. Yep, yep, exactly right. Eric Stockstill has been in big games before. While at South Carolina, also at Clemson. And their coaching staff has three Super Bowl rings and four national titles. With two on the play clock, Kentwell gets it away. His pass is only it's incomplete. Looked like it might be picked off there by Marcus Brandon, but he didn't hang on to it. Nonetheless, third down and ten for Louisville. And you know something? Kentwell is very fortunate that wasn't picked off. He got baited into throwing this ball. He didn't see that the coverage changed from what he thought was a too deep to man-to-man -man coverage, and he just didn't see all the guys over there. And, Rod, you talked on the first drive about Middle Tennessee hitting Cantwell. That time, Eric Walden hit him again. And a wide receiver trying to block Walden, a defensive end, on third and ten. They converted to third and ten earlier. Cantwell hit again, and it's incomplete. Eric Walden hit the quarterback again, and it's fourth down and ten. This time he comes from the opposite direction, right from the quarterback's face. 
You see a huge offensive lineman and a little defensive lineman. And that is the speed and quickness that they talked about before the game. Campbell appears to be okay. He went down awkwardly. They're already missing their starting quarterback, Brian Brom, and then a bad punt. Desmond Gee is going to let it go. And it'll be great starting field position for Middle Tennessee after a bad boot by Todd Flannery. Now, what? 7-3, Middle Tennessee leads. Let's get Heather Cox in here. Dave, two weeks ago, Middle Tennessee went to Oklahoma and lost 59 to nothing. Coaches say even on the first possession, when they were four and out, they saw fear, awe, and shock in the eyes, and they never recovered. So this week, the coaching staff's goal was to have it be fun, light, loose. They put in some trick plays, all to keep the mood light. Even before that touchdown, you noticed a difference on the sideline. This is a team that is very confident. First, it was artificial. Now it looks for real. And they started their 46 after a 25-yard punt. Global blitzing on first down. And down goes Clint Marks. Loss of five on the play, sacked by Malik Jackson and Amobi Okoye. The Middle Tennessee offense has nine rushing touchdowns. They rely heavily on their running game. At tailback, Eugene Gross Birch is the fullback, and Clinton Porter gets involved in the blocking. Now, Eugene Gross might be the best football player on this team. He's a great runner, blocker. He's a great receiver out of the backfield. He's the one that makes this go. But a four-yard loss on first down as Lobo gets its 15th sack of the season. They're seventh in the country in that total. And they lost Elvis Doomer, builder of the NFL. He led the nation in sacks a year ago. There's a drop ball at midfield. It would have been a touch, or would have been a seven or eight-yard game, but uh, Teron Henry couldn't pull it in. Let's check out that Louisville defense. The defensive line, very good. Okoye leads the way at defensive tackle. Yeah, a big matchup problem for Middle Tennessee. Okoye is a big guy up front, 315 pounds, only 19 years old, but he's a senior, and that guy is going to be a problem all night long for the smaller offensive line. Middle Tennessee trying to keep momentum. Third down and 14. Four-man rush this time. And Marks finds a man, but well short of the first down. Caught by Jay Robinson, but only four or five on the pickup. It'll be fourth down, tackled by Malik Jackson. And the Louisville defense having its best year under Bobby Petrino. Mike Cassidy is the defensive coordinator. They are fifth in rush defense, eighth in scoring defense. The best under Petrino, 20 points per game allowed. They're half that mark this year. Obie Smith to punt it to Patrick Carter. Carter will field it at the 11th. And he lost the ball. Middle Tennessee recovers at the 13-yard line. Jonathan Harris comes up with a football, and the Blue Raiders are in scoring position. But watch the end of it here. Carter just loses the ball, clearly a fumble, before he even got close to being down on the ground. Look at him, the ball comes out early. Right now, Louisville is just getting out hit. Number 22, DeMarco McNair just leveled the blocker, and that made the returner completely naked of support. First down and goal. Or first down and 10, rather, at the 14-yard line. Marks with a quick throw to the sideline. And it's pulled in by Bobby Williams, his 19th catch of the year. William Gay on the tackle. Bobby now Williams has the catch. Middle Tennessee with 11 takeaways in the last three-plus games after only two the first two weeks. And that last one was more of a, a giveaway yeah. by Louisville instead of a takeaway by Middle Tennessee, but it goes in that same column. Three-yard pickup on the pass play. Here's second and seven. Gross on the carry. 
met in the hole by safety Brandon Sharp. No gain in the play, maybe even a loss of one. And Trevor, a sudden change situation like this for the Louisville defense, you have to like how aggressive they've come out after having to get on the field in a hurry like that. They need to stop Middle Tennessee now and hold them to a field goal attempt because Middle Tennessee's offense is not good enough to drive the field against Louisville's defense with any consistency. A special teams play like this or a defensive turnover giving them a short field is their only hope. Third and three at the Louisville eight-yard line. Gross on the carry. And he's going to be a couple of yards shy of the first down. Obobi Okoye with the stop at the six-yard line. And Middle Tennessee will settle for a few goal attempt. Yeah, they, they decided not to take the risk of throwing the ball. They didn't want to take a shot and losing some yards there or maybe a turnover. They're content to come away with the field goal attempt. Surprise? Absolutely not. The longer that this game continues where they're in it, the more chance they have for Louisville to start pressing. It's Louisville's mistakes that will win this game for Middle Tennessee. 23-yard field goal try by Colby Smith. Three more points for Middle Tennessee. If you're Louisville special teams, you got to be embarrassed. You've handed Middle Tennessee 10 points, including an 88-yard kick return for a touchdown by Damon Nixon. Middle Tennessee leads Louisville. CX-7, the SUV you never saw coming. And John Hancock, the future is yours. Welcome back to Music City. Those guys are in tune, but Louisville isn't right now. Down by seven, tying its largest deficit of the year. They were down by seven to Miami. Ended up winning that game 31-7. to Brian Brown got hurt in that game and isn't even throwing, expected to start throwing a ball perhaps on Sunday, and could return for their game next week against Cincinnati. Certainly should be back for their contest against West Virginia on November 2nd. Matt King to boot it away to Guy and Thomas. Thomas at the 8. Out to the 25. Good bounce back by Louisville special teams out of the 32. Well, we talk about putting pressure on Hunter Cantwell, knocking him around, and Middle Tennessee has done that so far in this ball game. Even when he's gotten rid of the ball, he's taken some hits. And that's exactly what they want, Trevor. He's not in rhythm. He doesn't have the confidence that you need out of your backup quarterback right now. Yeah, every other pass attempt, he has been hit so far in this game. And we talked about the mental side of it, about being decisive at the line. Well, you're getting hit from unexpected directions. It's hard for a backup to be decisive. And has missed his last four. From the 32, it'll be Strickland. Not a lot of running room. Maybe back to the line of scrimmage. Tripped up by Trevor Jenkins. You know, Trevor, this middle Tennessee defense they are very quick and fast. They're small, but they're very effective at getting up the field beyond this offensive line. Yeah, this, last year they averaged 284 a man on the defensive line. This year, Manny Diaz, defensive coordinator, wanted to go with a smaller line. They're almost 30 pounds lighter at 255, but they can penetrate that. Manny Diaz, only 32 years old in his first year as defensive coordinator. Colby Smith on the carry, and he goes nowhere. Slammed down at the 35 again by Jenkins. Justin Rainey also there for Middle Tennessee. Yeah, Trevor, I, I noticed the shock on your face as we talked to the coaches yesterday, and they were talking about their defensive line. They, said, they don't care about reading anything. They just go after the quarterback. They do. Their reads are, once the ball is snapped, they look at one thing, and that tells them whether to crash or go straight up the field. Last year, Manny Diaz thought they had to think too much. They played tentatively. This year, they just go. Not bad for a former production assistant at ESPN. More on that story later. Kentwell on third and seven. Don't know who he was thrown to there. Incomplete. Louisville left the puck. Three and out for Kentwell in the cards. Hey, guys. 
This is your number one offense in the country at 44 points a game. And they really aren't moving the ball yet. I think they're as stunned that Middle Tennessee is giving them such fits. Well, we asked the question, why are the Louisville coaches so upset with their offense? I think we have the answer. There are legitimate reasons without Brian Brom and Michael Bush. Desmond Gee, the return man at the 27. Makes three men miss. And then powers into a cardinal, knocking one defender off his feet to the 42-yard line. Middle Tennessee special teams, pretty special in the first quarter. Welcome back to Nashville, about 30 miles from Murfreesboro, where Middle Tennessee is located. And it's a 10-3 lead for the Blue Raiders. There are about 25,000 or so Cardinal fans making the two-and-a-half-hour drive from Louisville to Nashville to watch this game here tonight. A lot of red in the stadium tonight. A lot of very quiet red in the stadium tonight. In the first four games of the year, only seven first quarter points surrendered. Ten in this game, and the touchdown coming on an 88-yard kick return by Damon Nixon. Excellent starting field position again for Middle Tennessee on its 42-yard line. Running play to McNair. He gets spanked back at the 41-yard line. Lamar Miles torpedoes him for a one-yard loss. Well, you talk about those ten points, but... It ain't on this defense. This defense has really been something. There he is, showing up right in the middle of your screen. That's Miles. They haven't given up anything but three points tonight, and that was because of the short field after the punt return fumble. How about the speed? Able to get to the ball that quickly and greet the running back. Global showing blitz. Pass caught by Williams at midfield. Got the first down. Picks up 11 on the play. The late Jackson and Gavin Smart on the tackle. Good throw by senior quarterback Clint Marks. And Trevor, this offense is a three wide receiver offense. I formation. The quarterback Marks is not the most mobile guy. No, he's about as mobile as the Statue of Liberty. But he's slippery. And he's going to hold or nearly hold most passing records at Middle Tennessee State. Because he's a guy who, when he gets on a roll, finds a way to win. And among active quarterbacks, guys, he is third in the country in completion percentage. He completes in his career about 67% of his passing. Back to McNair on the ground. This time he lowers the shoulder and drives into a Cardinal defender at the 43-yard line. Brandon Sharp, the recipient of that hit by the running back to Marco McNair. Gain of about three. All right, you see that attitude right there. It wasn't like Louisville's vaunted defense took McNair and, and pushed him back and he fell back on No, he drove into the tackler and drove him for another yard and a half down the field. And right now, Louisville is getting out hit. A lot of confidence by Middle Tennessee. A little bit different than a couple of weeks ago when Oklahoma beat Middle Tennessee 59 to nothing. Middle Tennessee has two shutouts of its own this year. McNair keeps on the ground to the 40. Got three or four. They're all Heyman on the tackle. Third down coming up. Now you look at what Middle Tennessee has done so far this season, that 3-2 and two record, that Maryland game, pretty competitive. And then you see the Oklahoma game standing out there, that 59 to nothing game. But other than that, they've been very, very strong defensively and very competitive. And a third down and five here at the Louisville 40-yard line. Marks making his 27 consecutive start at quarterback. And a senior tight throw as he hits Grigsby very close to the marker at the 36-yard line. It will all depend on where they give him forward progress. William Gay made the stop, and there's a Louisville player down at the 45-yard line. Michael Adams back up defensive end, the injured Cardinal. Adams a freshman. They've got a lot of freshmen on this global defense trying to replace players like Elvis Dumerville, who led the nation in sacks with 20. And what we've seen in the first quarter, I don't know about you guys, 
but based on the first four games and what we've seen in the first quarter by this Louisville defense, the best they've had under Katrina. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, Mike Cassidy came over, and the year before he was here, they were number 93 in the country in defense. Since then, they've just gone up the charts, and he's turned this into a very aggressive defense, and he's not afraid to play young guys. As you take a look at the marker there, they picked up the first down. So two first downs on this drive against Bobby Petrino's Cardinal defense. Well, the aggressiveness is what's key. What he did was turn loose the athletes and let them attack the line of scrimmage, which is the same philosophy that Manny Diaz of Middle Tennessee has, the same philosophy that they brought in from Florida State and from NC State. And it puts a lot of pressure on the corners, but it allows for disruption at the line of scrimmage as we see Adams rip off the field. Guess what's going through your mind right now if you're a Cardinals player looking at the scoreboard and looking at the crowd? Don't panic. I mean, your veteran players will be telling each other, don't panic, relax. Hostile crowd, we still got a bad start, we'll get it settled down. That's what the veteran players would likely say. Freshmen might be a little bit concerned. And there are some freshmen on this defense, as we mentioned. More experience on offense, but remember, Cantwell is only in his fourth start, replacing the injured Brian Brown. First down at the 36-yard line. Here's an end around to Desmond Gee. We saw his ability to make guys miss on the punt return, and he gets about four or five on that play to the 31. Malik Jackson pushed him out. Well, you talk about what is Louisville thinking right now. As long as they stay behind, as the clock continues to tick, and as their coach, Bobby Petrino, is upset on the sideline, less experienced players will start to press. And remember, the key for Middle Tennessee is that they play perfectly, but even beyond that, Louisville has to make mistakes. So far in this game, it is Louisville mistakes that has caused the score to be what it is. All on special teams, although the offense has not looked good. Only 62 yards of total offense for the Cardinals. McNair on the call on second and six, got two to the 30. Again, Malik Jackson on the tackle. William Gay also there. So third down coming up for Middle Tennessee. Already two third down conversions on this drop. You know, if I'm Middle Tennessee right now, I'm probably thinking about two downs here. You know, unless I know that my field goal kicker can nail one from, from 50 yards out, you might think two downs here because that offense hasn't threatened your defense too much. You've played well. You can take your shot at picking up a fourth down if you don't get it. Heck, run the ball twice here. And you don't know if you're going to get back in this position again. You're inside the 15 the last time you had the ball, and you clearly settled for three. Third and four. And that pass thrown in there, going to be close to the first down. William Gay put pressure on Marks. And the pass was incomplete. Ruled incomplete on the field, intended for Chicola. Fourth down and four, and they're bringing the kicking unit out there. They're going to try a long yeah. field goal. Colby Smith is uh, the punter and the place kicker. Well, his range is about 50 yards. Two years ago, he was the all-conference kicker in the Sun Belt. Last year, he was the all-conference punter. He's got the leg to hit this. 47-yard attempt. Hit the crossbar. Hit the left upright. No good. Rich Stock still, still has to be pleased with what his team has shown here in the first quarter. Uh, plenty of leg on this thing, Trevor. Just not quite. A little to the left. Both these teams have good kickers. But I like the choice to kick that field goal attempt instead of go for it. Because, again, the more points they can put up, that means the longer Middle Tennessee stays ahead. Colby Smith to the outside on first down. And again, not a lot of running room for Cardinal backs. They did a pretty good job on Adrian Peterson, especially in that first half when they lost to Oklahoma 59-0. J.K. Sab on the tackle there. Trevor, I want to go back to that last point because I think they should have gone for it on third and fourth down. I think maybe running the ball because even though they're ahead, they haven't delivered a big blow yet to Louisville. And had they need to take a chance somewhere. I mean, heck, you're, you're playing the number 18. I mean, take a shot somewhere to get the knockout punch early and really make them concerned. Second down and eight. Cantwell to the air. And it's caught at midfield. Yerudia might be gone to the 15. Yerudia 5, touchdown, Louisville.
Tough to cover, big six foot six Mario Yabudio. And the sophomore goes 68 yards, and the Cardinals can tie it in the closing seconds of the first quarter. Well, they caught them trying to disguise their coverage. Free safety came over late. He's supposed to be helping in the middle. And Yerudia, just way too much speed. Armady on for the extra point. And we are even at 10. So the missed field goal, granted it was a 47-yard attempt by Middle Tennessee, and then Louisville comes right back on uh, its second play, and gets a touchdown, and Yerudia, one of the best players in college football when it comes to yards after the catch. And Trevor, he's a big mismatch problem. He's got great speed, but he's got a big body, too, at about 6'6". Defensive coordinator Manny Diaz told us yesterday that when he was talking about Yerudia, he didn't say his name. He said his number, and then he said that monster because he just <laughs> overpowers so many defensive backs. Second team all Big East a year ago, dropped 10 pounds in the offseason. Listed at 220, six feet, six inches. Here's your free safety moving over there late to try and disguise that coverage. And that's what Cantor Hunter, Hunter Cantwell sees. He sees the middle of the field open, and he takes his shot at it with that slant right on time. Manny Diaz, the defensive coordinator, a little bit irritated that they tried to hold that disguise too long, and it cost them in the middle of the field. That's what hurt them against Oklahoma. They did a good job against the run relatively, but they kept on being slightly out of position in the secondary, got burned deep. That's why tempo for Louisville is so important. When their tempo is right, they can catch a defense a little bit out of, out of, out of sync. Now, tempo means getting your plays together, getting to the line of scrimmage, running before the checks are made defensively. Tanner and Nixon back to receive. Here's Nixon who ran it 88 yards for a touchdown the last time he touched it. And barely gets back to the 20 this time. Out to the 22. And that is the end of the first quarter. An exciting opening stanza voice here in Nashville. Middle Tennessee State. Time number eight, Louisville at 10. Beautiful shot of a full moon here in Nashville, Tennessee. And why should we be surprised? It's such a freaky opening quarter that included an 88-yard kick return for a touchdown. Louisville, the number one offense in college football in terms of scoring, has made one play. But that one play, a 68-yard touchdown pass, good enough. To have the game even at 10 as we start the second quarter. Middle Tennessee takes over at its 22. Marks throws back to the other side to Bobby Williams, and Louisville not fooled. Williams stepped out at the 25-yard line, got only three on the play. William Gay on the cover. Mark running this offense, what he does so well is stay calm. I mean, he truly enjoys this game. And talking to him yesterday, he just seemed like a kid who happened to be old enough to play college football. That demeanor of real love and joy in the game of football. And right now, he's calm and directing his back. We're in school history in passing yards. And again, a very high completion percentage. Run and play to Crooks. Past the 30, and to the 31. Be about a yard shot of a first down. Lamar Miles on the stop. Rick Stockstill, in his first year as head coach, has really done a good job turning this program around, not only physically on the field, but also in the classroom. Three fourths of the kids on scholarship under last year's coaching staff had a grade point average under two. Only one kid on Stockstill's watch during the fall semester under a 2.0 point average. Uh, how many of those guys came in and said, oh, this is different. It's all about accountability now. Third down and one. Brooks gets the first down to the 33-yard line. Check out our ESPN2 game track. Been a pretty special night for Middle Tennessee. Kick return, getting it done. Right off the bat, an 88-yard kick return that got it done for Damon Nixon. And then it was the fumble on the punt return. The Louisville that set him up again. And then Yerudia answers back. You knew it was just a matter of time before the great athletes got the ball in space and made a big play. Longest career completion for Hunter Kentwell. 
Got to go to three and one as a starter and get Louisville to its first five and all start since 1993. Here comes the blitz. Dump off to Gross. Into the second level and into Louisville territory. Finally dropped at the 43 yard line by Brandon Sharp. Trevor, you talked up Eugene Gross as the best football player on this middle Tennessee team. He picks up 24 yards on that play. And he gets help from number 54, Franklin Dunbar. Take a look at Big Franklin right there. Throws the key block. Doesn't get his man on the ground. But William Gay, number 21, was distracted enough that he couldn't keep contained. That's great mobility on the part of a big offensive tackle. And a first down at the 43 of Louisville. Third time Middle Tennessee's been in Cardinal territory. On the slant, Williams was open. Travis Norton was uh, about five yards behind him, but the pass overthrown by Marks incomplete. You can see right now, Trevor, that Middle Tennessee is reacting to the pressure from Louisville. They're going to quick passes, three-step, screen passes, all of the things they think will take advantage of Louisville's desire to put pressure on the offense. You talked about accountability and responsibility with this football team. This was a heavily penalized team, one of the most penalized teams in college football the last few years, other than the penalty on the opening kickoff. They're pretty much mistake-free football for Middle Tennessee. Here's Gross on the middle, running away from defenders and bouncing off tacklers. He was not down all the way to the 20. His knee wasn't down to the 25. It was on top of a player, and he gets an extra five yards, 23 and all on that pass play. And that was on Marks, the quarterback. He kept his cool. He came off of his primary receiver. Just watch him uh, scan the field here. and comes all the way back to find Gross in the middle of the field. That's a good job by your quarterback. The under review. They're going to review where the knee went down. And actually, from that angle, it looked like it did go down. Preston Smith was uh, the man entangled with Gross at the 25. Yes. Yeah, that knee touchdown looked like it was about the 26-yard line. Touchdown several times. Yeah. That's the no-brainer. Shouldn't take long to look at this. You know, you know, Dave, you mentioned the accountability and responsibility and how good Middle Tennessee has been with penalties. You can see that really is around the 25-26 yard line. I, I, I was impressed by the fact that they made all of the team be responsible for infractions by one guy. If one guy was late to class or missed a class, then the whole team had to run for that guy's mistake. And you only get a certain amount of misses, and then you get suspended for games. They left one player home for the Maryland game because he was he missed three classes. The key there, though, for Rick Stockstill in, in instilling that discipline and accountability is that the academic discipline carries over to everything you do on the field. In the last three years, 53 Middle Tennessee players left the program, scholarship players, most of them, because they flunked out of school. Now, those guys are being disciplined in school, but that carries over because the little things that they have to be accountable for as students give them discipline in the little things as football players. You know, every coach will tell you the hardest thing to do when you take over a program is to change the attitude and the culture. And if you can do that, then you've got a chance. Trevor, I'm with you. I agree with instant replay, but this is ridiculous. And we saw it four times that his knee was down to the 25. I don't know what else they could be looking at. Yeah, I talk, never take this long. <laughs> You talk about you know, academics, and, and Rick Stockstill was telling us that their academic progress report, something the NCAA scrutinizes, was the worst in the country. And they're down to 70 scholarships right now because of uh, academic issues. And he says it's kind of like a 1AA school. But as things turn around academically, he's hoping to get the full number of scholarships back. And here's the ruling after a lengthy review process. Yeah, I think what this delay does to the momentum that Middle Tennessee had going on this drive. Stop them cold. After the play, after the review, replay shows the runner's knee was down at the 25-yard line. Please reset the game clock to 1307. Still at the first down. They're probably looking to see exactly where the clock was, and that's what took so long, because clearly you could see from the first review that uh, his knee was down at the 25. But when you, you talk about that accountability, though, 
And you talk about instilling the, the, the academic accountability to start with. It also lets the players know that this coaching staff means what it says. In the past, if there was a very talented athlete, his idea was, well, what are you going to do to discipline him? Not play me? You got to play me or you won't look good. And the philosophy of this staff is, hey, we only won four games last year with you. We'll, we'd rather have guys that are disciplined. And this whole program has done a whipsaw change of direction. You see the play selection philosophy, even right now for Middle Tennessee. First down at the 25-yard line. Marks in shotgun. Rolls to his left, throws back to the right. Nice one-handed grab. Penalty flag down. And so is the receiver after a one-yard gain. Steven Chicola, the tight end, taken down by Okoye and Jackson. Getting penalty marker on the play. Yeah, that's got to be a hold right in front of the ref on the far sideline there where the ball was thrown. Yep. Yeah, it looked like number 73, Jermail Jackson, had a terrific block out in space. But because that ball took so long to, to bring in on that one-handed catch, he had to hold the block for a long time. Now, Again, the official's taking a long time to figure out exactly where the spot is on the foul. Holding on the offense, number 73. The penalty's enforced from the previous spot. Replay, second down. This is their best offense. He's a good football player. He got caught up in a situation. I take a look at the left of the screen now, and he's working on number 11, Malik Jackson. He's got him here. His arms are outside. His That's arms are outside. But if he doesn't have to hold that block much longer, he still might get away with it. But because he was out there for so long, he well, threw the flag, and it was a legitimate he, call. If he just gets his hands inside instead of around the shoulder pads, he'd be okay. Notice the key words used by a former offensive lineman. If he gets away with it. <laughs> How many times did you say those words in your career? First down and 20 pump fake. And a pass overthrown intended for Teron Henry. Double coverage downfield. And Malik Jackson hit the quarterback marks on the play. We are in Nashville. Don't be surprised at the score. Here at LP Field, number eight, Louisville and Middle Tennessee even at 10. They pass by Gilmore, Trevor Maddish, and Heather Cox. Middle Tennessee has never defeated a ranked team. Just a few weeks back, lost to Oklahoma 59 to nothing. Things a little bit different today. Even though Louisville has uh, more passing yards than Middle Tennessee, it's a tie game thanks to an 88 yard kick return for a touchdown by Middle Tennessee's Damon Nixon. Pass through the hands of Grigsby and complete at the 30 yard line. So it'll bring up third down and 20. And they are in Colby Smith's field goal range. We saw a 47-yard attempt in the first quarter that had the distance but just hit the left upright. Yeah, and with that in mind, that affects your play calling here. You don't have to think about trying to pick up 20 yards for the first down. The smarter decision here is to pick up maybe 10 or so, give yourself a shot at a field goal. Here. You know, Rob, though, my thought is because that is the smart choice. So pull the trigger and throw it into the end zone. Oh, the aha. <laughs> the surprise. Shotgun on third and 20. Marks steps up. Pass batted into the air and incomplete. Nearly intercepted by Brandon Sharp. And we'll see if they punt it away or attempt a 52 or 53 yard field goal. Yeah, yep, looks like it's going to be about 52 from that spot there at the 35. Yeah, to take about seven yards on that. So, yeah, looking at a 52 yarder. They're going to punt it. They're going to pin Louisville deep. Patrick Carter awaits the kick at his 10 yard line. You guys surprised they're punting it here? I'm surprised they threw it so deep on third down. I'm surprised they're not kicking the field goal. I'm going to do it. Smith trying to angle it toward the near side and does a good job. Middle Tennessee plants Louisville inside its 10-yard line. Early second quarter. Do you believe it? Eighth right Louisville tied with Middle Tennessee. Back in Nashville under 12 to go in the second quarter. Middle Tennessee on an 88-yard kick return for a touchdown. Tied with number eight Louisville. Cardinal stepping out of conference to play Middle Tennessee from the Sun Belt. Big East play gets underway next week for Bobby Petrino's team. 
They'll play Cincinnati, then at Syracuse, and have a bye week, and then play the West Virginia Mountaineers. That's a matchup that a lot of folks have been talking about, but the Big East better than it's been. Petrino talked up Pittsburgh this week, and we saw Rutgers last week. The Scarlet Knights, a legitimate top 25 school. And will Hunter Cantwell continue to play quarterback for Louisville? And does that impact how well the Cardinals do? Brian Brom is still out with a thumb injury. Patrick Carter might play some quarterback today. He's completed one or thrown one pass, and that was when he was at Georgia Tech. Will we see him? George Stripling gets the call on first down, and nowhere to go, only one yard of the play. We mentioned Patrick Carter could see action today with more of that story. Here's Evan. Well, all season, Patrick Carter's been a wide receiver and special teams player first and quarterback second until this week when Coach Petrino decided in, in case anything happens to Hunter Cantwell, we have to have a plan. That plan would be that perhaps Patrick Carter would play at least a series in this second quarter, but you've got to wonder, guys, with the start Louisville's had, if we'll still see this play and so far, only seen him on punt return. Second and nine from the Louisville 10. Cantwell's pass caught. You're ready out loose again. Dropped at the 34. Well, you remember when Stefan LaForce was playing quarterback at Louisville, Brian Brom was the backup. And remember that Miami game a couple of years ago? They were in deep. The plan was to put Brom in in the second quarter, deep in their own territory. They did it anyway. So do they do it in this situation, tied at 10th Middle Tennessee, go to their backup? I think Heather makes a very good point. Why would you put him in, an inexperienced guy in that situation, backed up? And in addition to that, Hunter Cantwell needs reps now. I mean, they've been struggling. They don't have a rhythm going. You want to see him have some rhythm. There's your visa quarterback for the uh, opening two Big East games. Cantwell in trouble, hit again, and tried for Yerudia, incomplete. Another hit on the quarterback, Tavares Jones, this time getting to Cantwell. You see the dilemma for the head coach in deciding whether or not to play Patrick Carter now in these circumstances is if something does happen to Cantwell, you've got a guy that's completely green. As we look at Cantwell now, he can't find the open receiver and he gets hit. What if he got hurt there? What if he got injured? He might have got injured by Bobby Petrino for trying to throw the ball when he's got a guy wrapped around him. I mean, Petrino can't be happy about that. He was in his ear earlier. Upset with some of his decisions. Colby Smith gets the call on second down, past the 40, and more on the floor at the 42. Eight yards on the play. J.K. Sad made the tackle. You see that dilemma that, that Bobby Petrino has as to whether or not to get Patrick Carter in at this point or later or ever. You go back to that model of Brian Brom and Stephon LaForce two years ago. They played Brom every game in the first half. Then they got to Miami and LaForce got injured. Brian had to go in and almost led them to victory. Well, I think you're right. I think they're going to have to play him. It just probably didn't make sense to play him when this team was backed up towards their own goal line. They're down in one. They got the fullback. Brock Bowman lined up the tailback. Bowling up the middle with the first down yardage. Out to the 48-yard line before Sad makes the stop. Five-yard pickup and a first down. We mentioned the uh, Brock Bowling story earlier. We want to talk nicely about Brock and his lovely family. His father, a former Green Beret in Vietnam, was a bodyguard for Larry Flint, among other things. And uh, he started training Brock at age eight to play football. He hired a personal camera crew to tape his high school games and sent it out to every Division I school. Pass over the middle of the wide open. Scott Kuhn, the tight end, inside the 30 to the 27-yard line. Good throw by Kentwell, tackled by Nixon downfield. You see the confidence growing. When Bobby Petrino allows his quarterback to throw the ball over the middle, that tells you he's really gaining confidence in him. And Brian Brom is very good at throwing the ball over the middle. He fits it into tight spaces. He keeps it low. Cantwell is not that experienced doing that. And that limits the offense a little bit. 25-yard pass play. This drive started at the Louisville 10. Ball at the middle Tennessee 27. Stripling looking for the cutback lane. Keeps his balance at the 15 to the 10. Inside the five-yard line. Now, this was a great call at the line of scrimmage by Hunter Kentwell, something he didn't do so well in the last game against Kansas State. That's it for the quarterback. They got the shift to the left, and now he checks. He says, look, the defense is all over here, so we're going to run it over there. 
And when this net gets off, there were 10 seconds still left on the play clock. That is the kind of tempo and decisive checking at the line that they want to see from Kenwood. Nice vision by the running back, George Stripling, the leading rusher for this team coming into the year. Or coming into this game on first down and goal. Bolin loses yardage. Tackled from behind by Eric Walden, who's played the game of his life today. Danny Carmichael, the true freshman, also led on the tackle. Yeah, Trevor, those shifts that we just saw on those last two plays are very important for offense. It can make a defense pause. When you shift tight ends like that, it changes the strong side of the field, and the defense will shift to get more numbers over there and changes responsibilities. That's good, good stuff that they're doing at Louisville. Midway through the second quarter, it's tied at 10. C6. Not a lot to cheer about, though, for Cardinal fans most of this game. Bobby Petrino has uh, been in the year of his quarterback, Hunter Cantwell, on numerous occasions. But the last two drives, 153 yards. Cantwell's looked good on this possession. Stripling the tailback on second and goal. Toss to Stripling. Has to cut it back. And does not get back to the line of scrimmage. Third down and goal after the loss of one on the play. There's that penetration we talked about. Trevor Jenkins, number 97, came flying through there and forced the cutback. Now oh, keep in mind, they have a real mismatch problem against Yerudia out there. Wide receiver number seven, six foot six inches. He's to the short side of the field now. That's a real advantage. That's a problem over there for Middle Tennessee. Empty backfield except the quarterback on third and goal. Cantwell hit. Incomplete. It was intended for Scott Kuhn, the tight end. Justin Rainey, the middle linebacker, hit Cantwell. And Louisville has to settle for three. Well, he's got five receivers out there, but he doesn't get the ball off instantly. He waited just a little bit too long for his receiver to get open, and you can't do that with an empty backfield. Yeah, with Justin Rainey coming around as quick as he is, Rainey got around his legs in a hurry. Art Comedy, who made a 31-yarder earlier, will now try a 24-yard field goal. And Louisville takes a 13-10 lead. Well, guys, are the rest of the schools in the Big East Conference going to school on what they're watching tonight from Middle Tennessee's defense? Well, I think what they're finding out is what we've all suspected all along, that Louisville is a different team without Brian Brom. I and mean, Brian Brom is a tremendous quarterback. And at some point during the season, when you take him out of that lineup, it has an impact. But every game that goes by that Hunter Cantwell plays and they win, they get the victory, they stay undefeated, and Cantwell gets that experience. We saw on that drive, very good decision making by Cantwell at the line of scrimmage. The more opportunities he has, the closer he'll come to that optimum level. And he got to start a couple of games last year, including the Gator Bowl, so he has big game experience. And this is an interesting position. Obviously, they probably expected to be up by a couple, three touchdowns at this stage, and they're only up three with eight minutes to go. And offensively, other than that possession, they've had one big play. They haven't really been able to yeah. consistently move the ball. Yeah, that's exactly right. They don't have that rhythm offensively that, that you're used to seeing with Louisville. They can come up with the big play. They can get it on the outside. They can get it out of the backfield with stripling. But this defense is a quick, fast defense, and the, the game plan is simple. Go hit the quarterback. And remember Middle Tennessee's best chance. Not that they will overpower or out-athlete Louisville. They won't. But that Louisville presses because they look at the scoreboard, they look at their coach, they start to get nervous, they make mistakes. We're still in the time of this game that that can happen. Flannery will kick it to Nixon again. And it's a touchback. Well, two SEC East rivals collide tomorrow night on ESPN. Tennessee and Georgia. College football primetime at ESPN at 7.45 Eastern time.
Georgia 4-1 against Tennessee under Mark Rick, but the lone loss two years ago in Athens. Okay, here Gage has been really playing well. David Cutcliffe coming back to Tennessee has really helped him. Look at the difference in his performance this year compared to last year. Almost 70% completion percentage. Two years ago, when they won in Athens, Ainge was the quarterback, didn't have a great day. About 150 yards passing, but good enough to give the balls the win. Can they do it again? Tomorrow night at ESPN, 7.45 Eastern. March to the air on first down, looking deep. And there was some contact downfield, but no penalty flag. It was intended for Bobby Williams, Gavin Smart on the coverage for Louisville. We look at that Georgia team. That defense is the number one scoring defense in the country. And they've gotten no production from the quarterback position in Georgia. They've played three different guys, two of them freshmen. And now Joe Tereshinsky, the original starter, is coming back. And even so, this team has the top scoring defense in the country. That's the captain of the Held all Miss to nine points last week, but scored only 14. And a five-point point win. Second and ten, Gross trying to run outside, cutting back for maybe one. Let's go on to Heather Cox for more on a Tennessee-Georgia matchup tomorrow night on ESPN. Yes, yeah, so much hinging on that big SEC battle. Some updates for you on Georgia. Their quarterback, Joe Tereshinsky, who was announced he will start after suffering that ankle sprain. Now, we talked and I found out that he's been practicing at full speed all week long. No swelling and no pain. But a new development, Georgia has been winning on defense and its kicking game. Well, it's Gross, a finalist a year ago. Brandon Cantu is out tore his hamstring yesterday, will be out for six months. So certainly a critical loss for Georgia as they play the first ranked team of the season. All right, Henry, that's at 7.45 Eastern on ESPN tomorrow night on third down and nine. Mark's pass is in there for a first down, and then it's dropped at the last second. Sharp on the hit on Jay Robinson. May have knocked it out. Looked like he pulled it in. But then the ball was loose on the field, and they say it's incomplete. Pass was there, though, by Marks. Instead, Colby Smith on a boot it away. Well, if you're going to pull off an upset, you have to make some plays like this. You've got to get the key first down. That ball was on the money. But that's the recipe for an upset. You have to make some big plays at the big moments of a game. Third punt of the day by Smith. Patrick Carter. All right, trouble with a kickoff earlier in the contest. Back to receive. And his trouble with that one. Jumped into the air and then bobbled it, but comes down with it at the Louisville 45. The Cardinals lead by three. ESPN 2's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Allstate. Are you in good hands? And Dickies, a legend in work. We're looking at Trevor Maddich's ride home. Hey, what about me? Wait a minute. Oh, we're in the car. Oh, okay. All right. That works. Trevor gets the horse and buggy. 13-10, Louisville over Middle Tennessee. Middle second quarter. A lot of Louisville fans here in Nashville. About a two-and-a-half-hour drive. They have packed LP Field. And they found a reason to be excited over the last five minutes. Cardinals have taken the lead and they have their best starting field position. Their own 45-yard line. But an up-and-down night for Hunter Cantwell has been hit by that man a lot, Eric Walden. Cantwell in shotgun. Cantwell with time to throw. Harry Douglas with a nice catch as he got drilled at the 41. First down Louisville. Cantwell had plenty of time to wait for Douglas on that crossing route over the middle. Waited a long time for him to come across. Look at the pocket, plenty of time. Now watch Douglas show up right there. There he is. He had to wait for him to show up, and he had plenty of time to do that. And well, certainly has a strong arm. In fact, interesting comments by Ron Prince, the Kansas State head coach, after their meeting last week. He said, Cantwell's as good as that other guy. He was speaking about Brian Brown. I don't know if I go there. Come on, come on, come on. Come on now. Paul Petrino, the offensive quarter, thinks Campbell has an NFL arm, an NFL talent, and he throws a bullet to Uribe on first down. But it's 24 for 17 more yards. Damon Nixon on the tackle. And he's finding some rhythm. And this series here, this is a momentum grab series. I mean, 
Miami. You had the drop ball on third down for Middle Tennessee, the short punt to the 45-yard line, and two completions now. And you're in, you're in scoring territory. Momentum grab for Louisville. On the 24-yard line. Running play to Colby Smith. Maybe a couple of yards to the 32. Again, Eric Walden on the stop. You look at those first two drives. They get nothing and have to punt. But 10 points out of their last two. And they started at their nine-yard line the last drive. This one started from their 45. Bobby Petrino again upset with some of his offensive players. They were not happy with their performance against Kansas State. Cantwell hanging in the pocket. Going in zone incomplete. Harry Douglas, the intended receiver. Ton of time for Cantwell. Well, oh, Cantwell, Trevor, that time he was trying to wait to throw to Yerudia, who was doing the crossing route that Douglas did the play before. But he couldn't get him open, and he waited and waited, and had finally to throw the ball away. He had no one to go to. You better not wait that long too often, because that's when fumbles occur. Defensive lineman will come in late, knock that ball out when the quarterback is looking down the field. Third and eight from the 22, where they have to set up for three again. Dump off to Smith. Got the first down. To the eight-yard line of Middle Tennessee. So they pick up a third down and eight. Dana Stewart with a tackle down field. One of the things that makes Bobby Petrino such a good coach is his play selection. He seems to know when to make the right call. That screen pass was perfectly timed on that third and eight. He knew the blitz would be coming, and they picked up the first down. Side a 10-year deal in July, quartered again in the offseason. The Oakland Raiders, one team that was interested in the services of Bobby Petrino. He's been in the NFL as an offensive coordinator with Jacksonville. Colby Smith to the outside and first down and goal. And he's going to lose yardage. Right down at the 12, David Nixon, the first to meet the running back, Colby Smith. <laughs> Rod, you're right about this being a potential momentum grab for Louisville. But it goes, that's if they score a touchdown. But if they are held to a field goal on this drive, that momentum is right back over with Middle Tennessee. That's absolutely right. You're absolutely right about that. Their defense, if they can get a stop now, they come out of this thing in pretty good shape. Second and goal. At the 10. After the two-yard loss. Kentwell surveying the field. Fine time. Now on the run, throws back across the field, incomplete. Intended for Yerudia. Nixon on the coverage, Trevor Jenkins on the hit. Yerudia was the only guy out. Ten guys in the block. They set one guy out on a pattern, and that's it. And when he's covered, there's nowhere else to go. You're absolutely right. And he almost made a mistake by trying to get this ball in there. Bobby Petrino just about lost his headset as he saw this ball came out. He walked out towards the field yelling because he was unhappy that a ball was thrown. It could have been picked off. Inside hand off the stripling on third down and goal at the 10. He gets to the three-yard line. We'll see if Louisville will go for it on fourth down inside the five. And, and the reason Bobby Petrino ran that draw play was because of the last play. He was unhappy that that ball was almost picked off. He thought it was a bad throw, and he did not trust his quarterback then to throw the ball again. When his lips disappear, you're in trouble. His mouth gets popped. His lips get thin. He is angry. I'm surprised they're not going for it here, guys. 20-yard field goal attempt. It'll be fourth and goal from inside of the four. I think Petrino's a little shaken right now with his quarterback play. Carmody hammers it through. Three trips into the red zone for Bobby Petrino's team and only three field goals as he continues to uh, yell at Hunter Cantwell. Well, when we talk with the local coaches this week, both Paul Petrino, the offensive coordinator, and his brother Bobby, the head coach, said, our offense is not playing well, guys. Even though they put up 24 last week against Kansas State and then thrashed Miami 31-7, to and we kind of joked and said, okay, you've had only 400 yards total offense. Okay, we get it. You're trying to motivate your players. But you can see what we've seen tonight. 
He's got reason to be concerned with his offense. Well, this offense really is predicated on, on the quarterback and the quarterback making the right decisions. And Bobby Petrino really believes in his offense and he has somebody open all the time and he does protect the quarterback. He's unhappy that he's not getting the efficiency he wants, but this is a growing pain with Hunter Cantwell. Well, it is. They're coming off a bye week. Keep that yeah. in mind, too. Played at Kansas State, got a tough win on the road. They didn't uh, they didn't function efficiently like Petrino wants. But with that two weeks, he expects more effectiveness and efficiency here. And we're going to talk later on about you know these kind of games, what we call paycheck games, where you're playing uh, either a 1AA or you're playing a lower-level D1 school, about what kind of benefit that serves college football. Right now, you wonder if Louisville is regretting playing this kind of a game as opposed to playing a, a Big East school. Although, if they're playing a Big East school, they might be losing right now. Well, this is not the only time these two teams will face each other. They have a series going. They're going to see each other for the next couple of years. And that'll be part of our Friday night debate, whether these kinds of games are good for college football. Todd Flannery to boot it away. Tanner and Nixon are back. Nixon with an 88-yard kick return for a touchdown in the first quarter. And he's got a hold of the outside this time. Past the 30 to the 40. Finally wrestled out of play at the 42 by Travis Norton. Kick return by Nixon. Look at the strength. He gets hit solidly right there by Bobby Buchanan. Shakes it off, runs right through it, and almost doesn't even slow down. Look like a pinball there. <laughs> Boing. <laughs> That's what happens with smaller man meeting larger man. But the smaller man is moving very fast. First down at the 42. Right from Middle Tennessee, do you run your offense or do you go to the air? Absolutely. And they're going to keep it on the ground. McNair to the outside. Horse collared at the 45. Mm -hmm. Tackled at the 47 by Malik Jackson. Five yard gain of the play. Saturday, ABC is a full day of college football at 3 30 Eastern Red River Rivalry, Texas, and OU square off in the Big 12. And then at 8 Eastern, Saturday Night Football presented by Southwest Airlines. You see two great running backs in an Oregon Cal game. As there's a, a loss on the play of seven yards as McNair gets taken down by Malik Jackson. And we're talking about those running backs in that Oregon Cal matchup. Jonathan Stewart at Oregon, 11th in the country in rushing. Marshawn Lynch at Cal, 14th in the nation in rushing. And I'll tell you this, don't, don't sleep on Dennis Dixon, the quarterback at Oregon. And he is really becoming something special with that spread offense that they've uh, adopted at Oregon. Nebraska, Iowa State as well tomorrow night. Check local distance for the game in your area. Third down and nine. Or Louisville's going to get it back. From the Middle Tennessee, 43. McNair drilled again as soon as he catches it at the 37-yard line. William Gill made the hit. What a lost opportunity by Middle Tennessee. All they needed was two first downs to be in field goal range. And now all of a sudden, with 118 left in the half, Louisville with their explosiveness and speed has a chance to go down and score. Yeah, yeah give a lot of credit to that Louisville defense. I mean, a couple of years ago. The game clock to 120. 120 on the game clock. A couple of years ago, you would not have seen that kind of an attitude out of that defense. This defense is very aggressive and very confident. They believe they can go stop you and take the ball away from you. One timeout remaining for Louisville. What a half for Middle Tennessee. Regardless of how this game turns out, you got to tip your hat to Rick Stockstill. The energy with which his team has put forth in this game, you saw it from the get-go. Heather talked about it earlier that the Middle Tennessee coaches felt they just didn't have fun during that Oklahoma game a couple of weeks back when they lost 59 to nothing. Heather, they're having a lot of fun tonight, certainly, even though they trail by six. Indeed, and the model for Stockstill started actually when he was a quarterback in Tallahassee for Bobby Bowden at Florida State. A year before he arrived, Florida State was actually talking about dropping football, but Coach Bowden came into a tiny stadium, four facilities, and Bowden had planned and pride, and he took the program to the next level. Now, when Stockstill went to Florida State, he knew he wanted to be a coach, so he studied and listened to everything Bowden said. And yesterday, he told me everything he does at Middle Tennessee falls back to his days as a player under Bobby Bowden and how he approached everything. He also said Bowden is the most motivational guy he's ever worked with.
like hard to believe considering he's coached with Steve Spurrier and Lou Holtz as well. Yeah, worked for some uh, pretty good coaches. Great kick here. Driving Carter back. He's had some trouble with kicks tonight. And he barely gets back to the 20-yard line. Colby Smith with a nice job hunting the football from his own 30-yard line. 51-yard boot, 7-yard return. Now the danger here for Middle Tennessee and the opportunity here for Louisville is great athletes in space. Look for the ball to go to Harry Douglas, 85, and Mario Rudy at number 7, and let their athleticism make a play. Ball at the 20-yard line, one timeout remaining. Manny Diaz in his first year as defensive coordinator, the 10th youngest coordinator in college football, the youngest being Major Applewhite at Rice. He has his 32. And they get that pass over the middle. Through in the tight end to the 50. Make that bondage the tight end to the 50. And finally dropped at the 48-yard line by Reggie Doucette. Uh, Bobby Petrino fully expected two deep coverage, and he sent a man down the middle of the field. Louisville leads the country in scoring, but only 16 points in this game. Pass to the sideline is pulled in by Chris Vaughn. Dumped at the 39. He's short of the first down. Clock continues to roll. Again, only one timeout left for Louisville. Uh, they have the one timeout, and the middle of the field has been wide open for them to use. Because they're going hurry up, Middle Tennessee can't get other guys on the field to change their offense. Now you see they're getting two more guys on the field. They can get into their nickel package, and they can change their coverage. They weren't able to do that before when Louisville was running hurry up. And this is an official timeout. They're going to measure, see whether he got the first down. It looked uh, initially like he was a good yard short, but that was before the spot. talking about Middle Tennessee earlier. Uh, they've been a 1A team since 1999. They joined the Sun Belt in 2001. They already played in Maryland this year. It is a Louisville uh, first down, so they get the excellent spot. They'll play South Carolina later in the year. And Stocks just said, look, we really got nothing out of the Oklahoma game except a $600,000 paycheck for playing them. But I said, their, their players also learned the words to Boomer soon. <laughs> so many touchdowns were scored. We kind of figured that out. Stockstill says we are getting something out of this game because it's part of our recruiting area and it's our first ever game on national television. And we're only down six points. Of course, he didn't know that would be the score late right in the second quarter. Awkward pass by Cantwell. That was a forward pass as he was being chased by Justin Rainey and Eric Walden. Well, and Manny Diaz did a nice job of changing their defense. He went to pressure, and then he put a safety in the middle of the field so that Louisville could no longer throw the ball over the middle. Former ESPN production assistant. Well done. NFL countdown. Decided to go into coaching nine years ago, and I was a coordinator in Division I. Out of the backfield, bad throw. Smith, the intended receiver. And it's third down and 10. 21 seconds remaining in the half. Louisville still has a timeout. Sterling Sharp, when he was uh, at ESPN, was a, a big influence, according to Diaz, on him. And Diaz remembers being in an interview situation with Bill Parcell saying, I'd like to be that guy. I don't know if I want to be the broadcaster. I want to be that guy right there. And so he decided to go into coaching. And, and he never played college football. In good company with that, though, Charlie Wells. They went to Florida State, but did not play. There's third down and 10. They go over the middle, and it's a first down to Douglas. Tackled at the 25 by Rainey. The clock will stop to move the chains, and again, Louisville has one timeout remaining. Now they've got two plays to try to get into the end zone here. Well, I don't know about that, Trevor. They just burned the timeout there. I'm not sure they're going to have two plays. I don't think he wanted the timeout. They got the first down. The clock was going to stop anyway. I don't think he wanted him to call time. I think he wanted to save it. Because now, if he gets sacked, it would be awfully hard to set up for a field goal. Right now, you're looking at about a 42, 43-yard field goal. 
keep that in mind when you're calling your play here, and you also have to keep in mind that you probably won't get a second play if you get caught in the middle of the field and don't pick up a first down. This is going to be it. Or if you get sacked, hard to get up there and get everybody set and spike the ball or get your field goal unit on the field. Coming up next on the Olive Garden Halftime Report, rooms out in Oakland, Major League Baseball. And the Saturday's big game among the subjects that will be discussed by Reese Davis and company at the half. Nice to see the Oakland A's get the uh, monkey off their backs for not coming through in elimination games. Games will be, uh, be a good time back in my hometown. Oh, you're an A's fan now, huh? When did that start? Never heard you mention it before, right now. Well, that's, you know, I try to keep those things in perspective. You know? <laughs> but hey, you know, you're winning. You gotta jump on the bandwagon. Well, you don't have uh, many college bandwagons to jump on these days. <laughs> Stanford off to an 0 5 start. First down at the 25 yard line. So they elect to throw the ball instead of the field goal try. They go to the end zone and it is caught for a touchdown. Eurydia. It looked like it might have been intercepted by David Nixon, but it ends up in the hands of Eurydia for a score. Well, they elected to throw the ball instead of kick a field goal, and it works out. Well, a tremendous throw, tremendous catch, but I can't figure out how Nixon missed this ball. He was playing center field, and he had the time to jump, and it looks like it just went through his hands. Second touchdown tonight, fourth on the year for Mario Urudia. Extra point is good, and that has to just be a killer if you're in Middle Tennessee to get that touchdown up in the final 15 seconds. Yeah, when that ball went up, I think everybody on the Middle Tennessee side believed it was an interception. Watch the end of the play up to the left of your screen. Watch Nixon. Look at him. He's right there. He jumped too soon. He, he jumped got a too soon. On it. Yep. He jumped too soon. He's playing the ball. He comes over and jumps too soon. Well, Cantwell with 12 completions and his average is 24 yards a pop. Yerudia in the top 10 of the nation in yards per catch, averaging 21 yards a reception, 33 and a half yards a grab in this game tonight, and those two TDs. And you talk about some of the great receivers in college football, Calvin Johnson, Sidney Rice. This guy is really starting to make a name for himself. He's averaging 21 yards a catch coming into this ball game, and he is a monster to deal with because he's a mismatch with size and speed. He's 6'6", 220 pounds. Typically, if you're that big, you're a possession guy. You're not as fast as you're really. Typically, if you're that fast, you're not as big, but when you've got the combination of the two, there's no weakness. That's not fair. they got to stop growing receivers like that. They can play tight end. Yeah, you should have wide receivers that are that big and that fast. Well, a lot of people have been comparing Calvin Johnson to Larry Fitzgerald, who won the Belinikoff Award, was the third overall draft pick. But Johnson's got more speed. You talk about unfair. You've seen his size and his speed. The unquestioned number one pick in the NFL draft, according to several scouts in April. And a short kick and a knee taken at the 32. Three seconds remaining. As Clinton Porter takes a knee, we'll see if Middle Tennessee will take another knee. And the clock will run on the change of possessions. So they won't even have to go out there. And Middle Tennessee will go into the locker room, trailing by 13. And 23-10 Louisville. Mario Irudia doing the damage in the first half. Four catches for a buck 34 and two TDs. Bobby Petrino, the head coach for Louisville, is with Heather Cox. And Coach, a great finish to the half, but probably not the start that you had envisioned. What did you do to turn things around? Oh, not the start at all. We got to cover kickoffs better. I thought our defense was playing pretty good. Uh, offensively, we've got to make sure we protect the quarterback, run the ball better, keep throwing it to number seven. He looks pretty good. During the bye week, offensive tempo was certainly the emphasis. Are you satisfied with the effort so far there? No, I'm not satisfied at all. We want to do a better job. We are doing better in and out of the huddle, but we got to block better and run harder. All right, Coach, thanks so much for your time. Good luck.
Now they've been averaging over the last two games less than 400 yards total offense per game. 348 yards in the first half and a 13-point lead as we go back to the studio in Reese Davis. Dave, this has not been a year for upsets. In fact, only one top 15 team has been beaten by an unranked opponent. That wasn't much of a surprise. Florida State losing to Clemson. This would have been, but then all of a sudden, powerful Louisville offense, right on target, by the way, to reach their 44 points, actually a little ahead of target per game. Quick strike at the end of the half. That's a backbreaker for Middle Tennessee. Mary Uri is just too tough to cover. He's too tall, he's too fast, and too strong, but that last play is going to hurt them mentally in the second half. Oh, what a great opportunity for Coach Petrino to be able to chew his team out and say, you're not playing well, and we're up by 14. Great lesson. And a lesson learned is that you have to seize opportunities when you have them, and in baseball, it's something the Minnesota Twins have been... ESPN2 Primetime College Football is broadcast in high definition, presented by Pioneer Plasma. Back in Nashville, ready to start the third quarter. It is 23 to 10, Louisville. But the game closer than the score would indicate. As we look at our game track, special teams, a big key for Middle Tennessee in that first half. Oh, very much so. And this was pretty much the offense. Damon Nixon, early in the first quarter, takes this one back 88 yards. And, and that was the only time that they got there. But Mario Urrutia, big for Louisville. He's been their offense. The big plays, the scoring have been primarily great individual plays by Yerudia. Here the ball gets tipped by Nixon as he flashes across, and Yerudia keeps his focus and makes the touchdown catch. But again, Louisville had to settle for field goals three times in the red zone. It was a six-point game, then an 80-yard drive by Louisville to close out the first half and another touchdown pass to Urudia with under 10 seconds to go. How does Middle Tennessee bounce back from that? Well, I, I think that's the challenge for them mentally. They have to find a way to get a cheap score early in the third quarter so that they can get over that one and get right back into it because they certainly have to feel like they gave up a cheap one at the end of the first half. Well, they've got to get Bobby Petrino angry again. You <laughs> saw how calm he was talking to Heather before halftime and how relieved that they got that last touchdown. If he is upset, then the younger Louisville players players might press. It's the mistakes of Louisville that give Middle Tennessee their best chance. Middle Tennessee will start with the football. And remember, Damon Nixon had that 88-yard return for a touchdown in the first half. Here he is with it at the 15-yard line. This time doesn't make it back to the 20. Tackled at the 17. Middle Tennessee hit coach Rick Stockstill moments ago with Heather Cox. Okay. Coach, down by 13 at the half. What is the biggest puzzle that you have to solve in this game? I think the big thing, Heather, is we got to convert on third down offensively. Um, you know, we got down here in the red zone. We had a penalty that knocked us back. But the big thing is we got to play better on third down. And, and then we've done a good job on defense of not giving up a big play. But that one there at the end of the half hurt us a little bit. Coach, best of luck to you. Thank you. Only two out of eight hundred on their third down. They had 85 yards total offense in that first half. They had almost double that total on kick returns. Got to find a way to move the football. They run that little duck ghost play where they fake the end around and hand it to the running back Gross. He's to the 20. Gets two yards on the play. We mentioned only 85 total yards for Middle Tennessee. 348 for Louisville and Yerudi at 134. He had more uh, than the entire Middle Tennessee team. Yeah, and it's really been a great performance by the Louisville defense. They really have done a great job, except for when they were backed up and they had no choice but to give up three points. Two yards on the first down rush by Gross. Second and eight from the Middle Tennessee 20. Another running play to Gross. About three yards to the 23, dumped by Miles and Preston Smith. So already, a key third down and five coming up for Middle Tennessee. Roger, talk about that Louisville defense. It, for itself, is pitching a shutout. The touchdown for Middle Tennessee is a kickoff return. The field goal also came on a miscue in a short field. The defense stopped them to force that field goal. And so this group is doing a terrific job. Yeah, particularly up front. Remember, Okoye has just been outstanding playing over the center. He's just been wreaking havoc inside. Only 25% on third down. Louisville scored the last 20 points in the game. Pass over the middle is incomplete. Broken up. Intended for Williams. Gavin Smart in the coverage, and it's fourth down. Three and out 
for Clint Marks and Middle Tennessee. And more relief and more happiness for Bobby Petrino. Lowers the pressure on those guys at the sideline. Louisville should have a short field, although Smith with a 51-yard punt earlier in the game. After Carter has had some difficulty on punt returns and kick returns hanging onto the ball. Another deep kick. Carter inside the 30-yard line. Gets a block. Pass to 40. And hit out of play at the 49-yard line by Jonathan Parks. Penalty flag on the field. About 20, 25,000 Louisville fans. It's only about a two and a half hour drive from Louisville to Nashville. About 30 minutes from Murfreesboro, where Middle Tennessee is located. It's hard to get tickets up in Louisville anymore. Papa John's Cardinal Stadium, 40 some thousand fans. They're planning on expanding it to over 60,000. Sunbelt officials and a block in the back and a personal foul. So offsetting penalties unless. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at the map here and the uh, separation between Louisville and Nashville. So we said about two and a half, three hour drive, depending on how fast you go. The Louisville team made it down here in two and a half hours, but that was benefit of a police escort all the way down. It didn't, didn't take them very long. And you just take I-65 from Louisville to Nashville, and we were down in Murfreesboro, and we did not have a police escort. It took us about uh, 45 minutes to uh, get to Murfreesboro, so pretty short drive for Middle Tennessee, and it's a fan base to come up to LP Field, home of the Tennessee Titans, and watch some football. It almost took us 45 minutes to go to 10 blocks to get into the stadium from the <laughs> hotel. Well, the first three drives not good for Louisville's offense, and if you caught the end of the half interview, Bobby Petrino and Heather Cox, you saw relief in the eyes and in the voice of Petrino. Last four drives, much better. Petrino's certainly not satisfied, though, with that first half offensively, and maybe he won't be until Brian Brom is back under center. Nothing against Hunter Cantwell, who's filled in admirably for Brom. His numbers are pretty good. He's 2-1 and one as a starter, but put in tough situations, but they need Brom back from that thumb injury. And I talked to him uh, before the game, and he's carrying some silly putty or something like that in his pocket, and he's using it to work that, that right hand to squeeze it and strengthen it. He says that he's not feeling an awful lot of pain. He, he does expect to start throwing the football in a day or two. Running play and first down to George Stripling. Middle Tennessee's done a pretty good job against the run. Only two yards there. Marcus Brandon on the tackle. With more on Brian Brom, we bring in Heather Cox. Well, we talked about that dislocated thumb. He did have surgery on it. There's actually a wire inserted into that thumb. It'll stay there forever to keep that joint together. Now, the one bright spot he did tell me is while I've been waiting for my thumb to heal, that ACL in his knee that was reconstructed a year ago has gotten stronger and stronger. He said his legs are as good as they've ever been. He's certainly hoping to show that come next week against Cincinnati. That's a pretty amazing recovery. Suffered that ACL injury less than a year ago. It usually takes about a year and a half to get back to where you were. You really had dropped it over the middle. Oh, had a pass maybe a little bit behind it. And now it's third down and eight. Yeah, Rudy is hobbling a little bit. Well, you talk about that wire in his thumb. His legs are stronger, Brian Brown's. But unless he takes his shoe off and throws it with his toes, then the weak link of that thumb is what's going to matter. And the question will be, will he be able to get the zip on the ball on the longer throws out to the sideline and down the field? Because if he can't, it'd almost be better off with Cantwell. On third and eight, they run Stripling. He makes one man miss, but still going to get hit about four yards shy of the first down. Justin Ramey made the stick. And it's fourth down and four, and Louisville will punt it away. Now getting back to uh, Brian Brom, you know, he, he did speak to Heather, and he spoke to me as well, and he made it very clear to both of us that he really expects to be playing in a few days. He does not think he's going to be out much longer. Again, Cincinnati next week, as Heather mentioned, then at Syracuse, followed by a week off, and then West Virginia on November 2nd. Bradley Robinson in the punt return. Trying to get to the outside, hard to do against that Louisville speed. Gets cut down at the 22-yard line by Lamar Miles. Can Middle Tennessee come back? Down 13, early third. Can Middle Tennessee make a run? Less than 100 yards total offense. The only touchdown and a kick return. Do they have some tricks up their sleeve, perhaps? Down by 13. Seems like there have been several times in which Louisville looked like it was going to blow it open, but it didn't happen. 
They're averaging less than four yards per carry, Louisville is, and perhaps that's the reason why. They haven't been able to establish the run. Middle Tennessee still trying to establish the run, and the mark of McNair goes nowhere. A Brown on the tackle, zero yards on that play. But part of the problem for Middle Tennessee is that their wide receivers cannot beat Louisville's corners. Louisville is playing a lot of man coverage. They believe their DBs are better, and they're able to turn everybody else loose and shut down the running game. That puts a lot of pressure on that man. Clint Marks, if the wide receivers can't get open, he's got to find the running backs, and he's got a good one in Eugene Gross coming out of the backfield as we look at Mario Yerudia with that left foot off the ground. Yeah, we saw him hobbling last time he was on the field. They hand it off to G on the end around. There's that trickery we thought we might see. Gain of nine on the play. Zach Anderson on the tackle. With more on Yerudia's injury situation, here's Heather. Well, Mario Yerudia was kicked in that left shin. The athletic staff has actually put a shin guard, like a soccer shin guard, on that left shin. And right now you can see he's testing it just to make sure that that contusion isn't affecting his play. We do expect to see him back out on the field. Got a big game. Two touchdowns in the first half. He's been the difference in the game. He's been the offense for Louisville. Big third down and one. They're just two out of nine on third downs today. McNair trying to power past the marker and does to the 33 yard line. William Gay on the tackle, but it's a first down for Middle Tennessee. This is a very important series for Middle Tennessee. That Louisville defense has settled in. They feel like they have a good handle on this offense, and they're just playing their routine. They're not bothering to change things up an awful lot. They settle in with the man coverage, the pressure inside, and it's been working. Middle Tennessee has got to find a way to get the ball down the field. They go out of the shotgun here on first down. Play clock at five. Side handoff to McNair to the 36-yard line. Zach Anderson with a tackle. Three-yard pickup. Well, they do have good tight ends. The Brady Clinton corner number 85, Stephen Chicola, was one of the best tight ends in the Sun Belt last year. And they haven't used them in the passing game at all. And I would think that Coach Stockstill would try to think of what players he can get involved as playmakers that haven't been so far in this game. And there's one of them right there. That's the corner. Shotgun again on second and eight. This time Marks keeps. Tough to run to the outside against those fast defensive linemen for Louisville. Malik Jackson and Zach Anderson plant Marks at the 33 for a loss of two. Well, they're trying to run some read zone here with the quarterback. And you can see here, he, he pulls it out. He could have handed it off. Instead, he chooses to. But from a personnel standpoint, you've got to fool the defense in order for Marks to really get that corner because of what you mentioned, Dave. It's a fast, movable defense, and Marks is not the prototypical runner at quarterback. Louisville's defense very much improved this year. Well, Middle Tennessee's two best receivers aren't on the field. Williams isn't out there, but... Jay Robinson is now. Third and nine. Pump fake. Open man on the sideline. And a nice cutback by Grigsby. To the near side at the 45. Finally wrestled down at the 35 by Latarius Thomas. Great run after the catch by Jonathan Grigsby. Now you're exactly right because he did not even have the first down when he caught this ball. Look, he's about five yards short of that, and because of man coverage, there aren't guys coming up to make the tackle. They were being run off by other receivers, and he picked up a lot of yardage. The Rod Grisby, a former walk-on, who earned a scholarship because of his attention to detail. He didn't do that with great speed. He did that by understanding the defense, like you said, what the angles were, and he used those angles to his advantage. 32-yard pass play. Fourth time today, Middle Tennessee has been inside the Louisville 35, and they have three points to show for it. And a beautiful open field stick by Preston Smith on DeMarco McNair. And that's just all speed right there, one-yard loss. They have so much speed on this defense. 
you know, they're linebackers, you know, going about 220, 215 pounds, all about 6'1", six, 6'2", six, and they can all run. Take a look right here. There's your man Preston Smith. Watch him get to the outside so quickly he gets beyond the blocker and is able to make that play easily. Yeah. Hunter Birch was the fullback that missed that block. He's the backup. Far Williamson is hurt. You can see he wasn't used to that speed. But Birch made that block. That would have been a big running play. Inside handoff to McNair. It's tripped up at the 31. Got four yards. And another tackle by Preston Smith. All right, Trevor, here's tackle another situation for you. I think you're in two-down territory here. Looks like there's Louisville players slow getting up now. Well, and there's Smith, too, who was slow getting up. But two-down territory. Yeah, Preston Smith was the guy. If you don't get it on third down, you can go for it on fourth down here. You have to start thinking about when to take some chances, and this might be the place since you're on the Louisville 30-yard line. See, I look at the grand strategy, Rob, and I think that if they have a chance to kick a field goal, if it goes to fourth down, they should kick it to keep the pressure on the Cardinals. They need Cardinals' mistakes. Here comes a blitz. Marks hit as he throws. Tipped. Almost intercepted by A. Brown. It's incomplete. And it's fourth down. Well, if you're in four down territory in that situation, then you need call, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, that's why I think, you know, with a third down and four or five like that, if you've got two downs here, then go ahead and run the ball again. Give yourself a better chance on fourth down to make the decision. Now you've got yourself in a fourth and five. And I don't think this is a high percentage. But they are going to go for it. I mean, they got nothing to lose. No, I mean, right now, Trevor, I mean, with fourth and five, I agree with you. Kick the field goal. But if you run the ball on third and fourth down, you know, you got a better shot. They go four wide. Lobo showing blitz again. March pass. Incomplete. He had Bobby Williams for the first down. Couldn't pull it to the chest. And Louisville takes over. And perhaps the final opportunity for Middle Tennessee to crack that Louisville defense. Coming up, the Friday night debate. The 2006 Paycheck Games. Are they good for college football? Rod and Trev debate it next. ESPN 2's College Football Primetime. Brought to you by Sonic. It's not just good, it's Sonic good. And American Chemistry, essential to living. Learn more at AmericanChemistry.com. Country Music Hall of Fame opened in 1967 on Nashville Story Music Row. Relocated to a new location downtown in 2001. See, Elvis is in the building. No, Elvis is on the building. 23-10, nice. Louisville leading Middle Tennessee. Five and a half to go in the third quarter. Louisville takes over after Middle, C Middle Tennessee turned it over on downs. Here comes the end around to Douglas. And he gets a block from Cantwell. Tackled in Middle Tennessee territory at the 47-yard line. But Bradley Robinson, number 24, is going to flash from the left and chase him. Look at blue number 24, and he just can't catch up to Harry Douglas. That's a fast, fast man. Well, clearly, we have seen tonight the difference in athletic ability between these two schools. And it's no surprise, but sometimes when you actually see the difference on the field, it really stands out for you. Here's a pass to Douglas on the sideline. With the reverse, then catches it over on the far sideline. Reggie Doucette on the tackle. That's another Louisville first down. We mentioned that this is uh, one of those uh, so-called paycheck games. Although Louisville's actually getting paid by Middle Tennessee to come and play in Nashville, but they will play two more games in this series in Louisville. And Louisville will give Middle Tennessee 200000 for one game and then 250000 for another. Middle Tennessee also paid uh, by Maryland and Oklahoma earlier this year and will get $600,000 from South Carolina later in the season. Cantwell on first down to his tight end crew and he gets about eight to the 27-yard line. Here's what we're talking about in terms of the paycheck games. Uh, they get 350 from Maryland, 600 from both Oklahoma and South Carolina. Rick Stockstill, the head coach of Middle Tennessee, told us this week that they really get nothing out of that Oklahoma game other than the paycheck, but he felt they would get more out of this game against Louisville 
I don't think he's right, based on what we've seen tonight. Second and two at the 27. Cantwell to Douglas over the middle, to the 15-yard line, 12 yards and a first down. The reason he thinks he'll get more out of this game is because this is the first of three in this series, and Louisville's only two and a half hours away. It's within the recruiting range of Middle Tennessee, and this game on television gives recruits some familiarity with the program. First down to the 15-yard line. We're going to have Rod and Trevor debate whether these paycheck games are, are good for the game. Colby Smith, play action by Cantwell, and he's got Coon wide open inside the 10. Breaks a tackle and dies for a touchdown. Third touchdown pass of the game for Cantwell. And that one was very well executed. He hit the ball very well on his fake and then brought it out there perfectly in time to get it to Q. Armady on for the extra point. 27 straight points by the undefeated and eighth-ranked Louisville Cardinals. Trying to go 5-0 for the first time in the Bobby Petrino era. Coon with a 15-yard touchdown pass. Our Friday night debate is next when we return to Nashville. First touchdown catch of the season for Scott Coon. It's 30 to 10. Louisville leads our Sonic scoring drive by play 69-yard drive. It lasted only one minute and 41 seconds. That's Bobby Petrino football right there. Yeah, I mean, that was well executed, and it was a very fast drive. I mean, that's the way Louisville likes to play offense. Up-tempo, quickly, cover the field, half a dozen plays, and get a touchdown on it. And we saw Hunter Cantwell execute. He got the plays off quickly. He got the ball quickly to the proper receivers every time. We did not see him stand there and wait and wait and wait. Three touchdown passes for Cantwell. Lannery kicking off. Nixon had the lone touchdown in the first quarter, an 88-yard kick return. And he's got some running room past the 20, flag down. Nixon breaking tackles out past the 35 to the 37. Again, a penalty marker on the play at the 21. Seven unanswered global points and holding on Middle Tennessee on the return. Okay, we set it up before the break. Our Friday night debate. Games in which a school like Middle Tennessee gets paid to go somewhere and play football and like Oklahoma a few weeks ago get beat 59-0. Better showing tonight for Middle Tennessee, but are these games good for college football? Definitely good for college football. First of all, it's volitional. They don't have to schedule these games unless they think it's good for the program. Second, look at the process. Money leads to facilities, leads to better recruits, leads to wins, more fans in the seats, and that leads to more contributions from the community. That leads to money, and there the cycle goes. Many teams are not like Louisville that have the ability to raise so much money from the community without having those big paycheck games. If they don't have that capability, the paycheck games are probably the only way to prime that pump. If a program thinks they need it, why should they not be allowed to do it? We'll get Rod's take. I'm guessing it's going to be a little bit different. <laughs> First down from the 12. Marks rolling out. Beautiful throw to Teron Henry. Stayed in bounds and gets wrestled to the turf at the 37. Okay, Rod, you heard Trevor's take. He thinks it's good for college football because of the income that a school gets. What do you think? Well, I think Trevor makes some good points about the economic reality for schools that set up their program that way. But I think there's some things you have to face. One, 59 and nothing blowout games are not good for the fans. No one wants to go watch a game like that. No one wants to play in a game like that. It's not good for the players. It's downright embarrassing for the players and embarrassing for the coaches. Now, if you set up your model that way, that your program has to exist on paycheck games, then you probably have the wrong model. You can do it another way. You don't have to do it with paycheck games. You can follow models like Boise State where they went up the ladder playing teams that they could compete with until they were good enough 
to have a program and compete across the board. Well, in completion by March, there's no question, guys, that with now a 12th game in college football, mm -hmm. you're going to have a lot more of these kinds of games because you know, you're not going to play major interconference games every week. You're going to play Temple and you're going to play Middle Tennessee. Sure, but keep in mind, when you when you take, for example, the Pac-10, they added the 12th game, they made it a conference game. This is a choice. Some schools elect to play conference games, and just because you play out of conference, it doesn't mean you have to do a paycheck game. You can still play someone else. High pass by Marks, overthrown and complete. And Ryan, I think that's a good point. That's a very good point. There's more than one way to do it. However, some schools really don't have the option because of their community or because of where they are. They're in a small town. You know, and when the smaller teams, as we look at the 1AA teams that have beat 1A teams just this year, when you have these games, usually you get annihilated, but sometimes you rise up and have a defining win for the program. I think this is fine, but I don't consider these, and I don't think most people will consider these to be paycheck games. I mean, you, this is what you ought to do. You ought to play Duke. You ought to play teams that are in the middling of the 1A con of the Big Five conferences. You shouldn't play Oklahoma and Texas and get the big paycheck and get your brains beat out. Marks finds Gross on third down and 10. Beautiful open field wrap up by Lamar Miles. And it'll be fourth down and long and Middle Tennessee will punt. We'll talk more about uh, our Friday night debate as we go along. And you can log on, ESPN.com, keyword Friday night debate. Tell us what you think. Do you agree with Rod that this is not good for college football or that, that these so-called paycheck games are good for college football inside with Trevor Maddich? Yeah, I, I see you're rushing out to buy your tickets to the blowout special of the weekend. I, well, initially, <laughs> when you guys started debating this yesterday, and it didn't stop until, like, right now when I told you guys to stop. I was siding with Trev, but I think I'm coming over to your side, Rod. Carter on the kick return to the 15-yard line. Up to the 27. Well, why? Why are you swayed to the dark well, side? I, I just, you know, this has been a great game. <laughs> this, has been, this has been a great game, but I think, you know, few and far between when you're talking about schools like Louisville and Oklahoma. It's one thing when you have Northwestern. Well, Colorado this year is not very good. Or Duke or Stanford Duke, yeah. or any of those teams right now, yeah. But, but when you're a Louisville or an Oklahoma or an Auburn, there's nothing that the opponent gets out of it other than a paycheck. And that paycheck's not really enough to, to make a significant contribution. But if they think so, and it Who? often is, Who? then to prime that pump, the team that goes and gets the paycheck. Well, you why, talking... why tell them they can't because we say you're going to get beat badly. We don't want that. A little quick hitter on the end around to Juwan Spillman. Tackled at the 34. I, I think you're right, Trevor, that, that the administrators believe it's a good way to bring the money in. But you also have to remember that we're also, we also have to be cognizant of the experience that you're promising these young men that you bring to your school. When you bring them there, if you recruit them and say, we want to bring you here so you can get your brains beat out every week so we can make budget, that's a different story than, you know, hey, this is going to be a great college football experience and we're going to put you in a competitive situation. Those are two different realities. I, I thought initially, hey, if you're a, a player in Middle Tennessee and you get to Oklahoma, you get to tell your kids, hey, I played at Oklahoma. But, I don't know, you get your brains beat in, 59-0. I don't think you really want to tell anybody about that. In and out of the hands of Carter, incomplete at the 48-yard line. Well, that's good. So we'll just go ahead and tell him, you guys aren't good enough. We're going to have you play a bunch of kittens because you can't compete with anybody. What? I you don't know, think I... the teams in Middle Tennessee are, is playing are kittens. They're, the teams in their league are pretty good. There are plenty of other Division 1A teams they can compete with. Uh, look at what we've got so far. Pretty much split, guys, in under 10,000 votes. Again, ESPN.com, keyword Friday Night Debate. All I know is if this is the dark side, <laughs> it feels pretty good, Gilmore. Ah, uh, come on over. I've got a mask for you. You are my son. <laughs> Third down and three. Kentwell, open man. Look out into the secondary. Chris Vaughn to the 49-yard line, gain of 17, and a Louisville first down. Now, the Sun Belt Conference is going to a different model, Rod, and that is that they want to play paycheck games, but not for a season like Middle Tennessee is this year. Their model is to get those paychecks, but then build a better product on the field so that the fans will enjoy coming to the games and also get money from the gate at home. There's no question the way Middle Tennessee played tonight in the first half helps its program. They're on national television. Their players get to say, hey, we hung with Louisville. As Kentwell goes deep, 
and it's underthrown and intercepted by Nixon. He had the big play in the first half, and can return for a touchdown. Gets the pick here in the third quarter, Kent Wills first of the game. Good for him. Good for that young man. This is a pick he makes now. He gets a great jump on this one. And if you remember, right before the half, he had a chance to do this, and he missed it. But he keeps his head up. He comes right back, and he makes this play in the second half. Jimmy Riley was the intended receiver, but it was well underthrown. A game for Nixon. Had a chance to talk to him yesterday as a Petrino again yelling at his quarterback, Hunter Cantwell. And Kentwell can't wait to get away from that. Look at the body language. He's turned away. He's walking away. That's the kind of pressure that Middle Tennessee needs. But, you know, he handles it well. And obviously, Petrino knows what guys can handle. I mean, he's, they, he's not shrinking away. He's handling it okay. And he can't hide on that bench over there. Nope. Petrino was able to find it. It's a 20-point 20 to uh, 20 point lead for Louisville this week. Go to the pool. Getting chilly in Nashville. Louisville leading Middle Tennessee 30 to 10 as we start the fourth quarter. 27 unanswered points by the eighth ranked Cardinals. But a turnover. Hunter Cantwell's first interception of the game. Picked off by Damon Nixon. Middle Tennessee takes over at its 23. Marks takes and hands for Gross. And a nice run on first down at the 31-yard line. Malik Jackson on the stop. David Nixon having himself a ball game. Yeah, it started early. Big kickoff return. 88 yards for a touchdown that gave Middle Tennessee a brief lead. And then a pick just moments ago. Guy's had a real nice night for himself. He takes this seriously. We talked to him yesterday. He had a furrow in his brow. He already had his game face on. On the draw, Gross on second and two. Gets drilled by Lamar Miles, but picks up the first down. Let's get more on Damon Nixon with Heather Cox. Damon Nixon having the career night that you just saw, all while playing with a dislocated finger. Actually dislocated it while blocking a punt in practice on Wednesday. I asked him yesterday, are you still going to be okay to get that interception? He winked at me, smiled, and said, you bet. Well, he made it come true. Also seven tackles tonight for Nixon with the uh, dislocated finger. And his first career touchdown. 175 kickoff return yards. It wasn't just that one. Gross bounces to the outside. Another good run by Gross. He did step out at the 45 after a gain of eight pushed out by Brandon Cox. Hey, Gross is a very strong running back. He's he's very thick. He walked in the room yesterday, and you could just just tell. I mean, he's he's a difficult guy to tackle. Difficult to get your arms around because he is so, he's big. He's about 205 pounds, but he's only about 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, One of a few players on this team that has played in an NFL stadium before. We're at LP Field in Nashville back in high school in Statesboro, Georgia. Played at the Georgia Dome in high school playoffs. Here's Gross again. Breaks two tackles and gets the first down. Picks up about seven to the 49 of Louisville. Willie Williams on the stop. Murfreesboro is where Middle Tennessee is located. That's about 30 miles from here. Louisville is about two and a half, three hour drive to Nashville. So even though this is a road game for the Cardinals, they have uh, more fans than Middle Tennessee does in the stadium tonight. You have to be impressed with how well the fans of Louisville travel. I mean, some 20, 22,000 folks came down for this ball game. That, that's just tremendous. This is a regular season game, not a bowl game. Uh, Trev made the point earlier, uh, traditionally a basketball school. As on the first down, they get only a couple of yards on the ground. But when Bobby Petrino took over, um, after being there prior as an assistant coach, the interest spiked. And then that run a couple of years ago, where their only loss was to Miami, uh, there was kind of a cult following with uh, Louisville football, and it wasn't just in Louisville. Fans popped up from all over the uh, from all over the place. Uh, Bradford Smith, who was a great basketball player, played a little bit in the NBA. He was in the hotel today, talking up Louisville football. And they all love that guy, and that guy's as good a coach, offensive coach, as anybody in the game. Signed a 10-year contract in July after being courted again by several teams in the offseason, both college and pro. March pass incomplete, intended for Bobby Williams. 
Now, Petrino has coached some pretty good quarterbacks. Jake Plummer, Arizona State. And then obviously here in Louisville with Brian Brom, it's the final fours. Look at uh, the scoring in the top 15 since he took over. And when he was in the NFL, didn't he have Brunel yep. at the Jaguars? Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a hot property. I and mean, the Raiders wanted him last year, as you talked about. He signed the deal here. But people are going to continue to come after him because he's one of the top offensive minds in football. What do you guys think it'll take? For some to pry Petrina away from Louisville. I don't think they will. They're down a nine. And a nice catch by Bobby Williams on the sideline. It appears he's going to be just shy of the first down. I don't think they will. The Raiders offered him $20 million guaranteed dollars for four years. And I think Petrino right now has exactly what he wants. He is a hero at Louisville, and justifiably so. And the thing is, if he stays here, he'll make... $25 million plus over 10 years, but also he has a chance to be a hero in the community that his family loves to live in. If he leaves, he goes to a pressure cooker wherever he goes. Middle Tennessee going for it on fourth down and one. Marks on the keep, and he appears to have it at the 39-yard line. So let's say, for example, as a hypothetical, the, the Miami job is not open, but let's say that he decided to go there. He leaves a place where he can literally do no wrong, to go to a place where it's almost impossible to do right. Well, I, that's all fine and dandy, but I, I think you're missing the, the real reason why he'll stick around Louisville for a while. And I think that's his family. I think his family is very comfortable there. They've settled there. They've gone through the routine of going from Auburn to the NFL to Louisville, and they had enough of it. They want to be settled in a place for a few years. I don't think he's going to leave for a while. Well, you look at Nick Saban. When he was at Michigan State, the Giants' job was available. Did not get that job. As you look at Paul Petrino, Bobby's brother, the offensive coordinator. Saban then went to LSU, waited for the perfect opportunity in Miami where he could have some control of the personnel as they run a little double reverse and then a pass back to the quarterback. Cantwell is down there, but it's picked off. Intercepted by John Russell. Russell pass midfield. Finally down at the 44-yard line. Jay Robinson's pass on the reverse, intercepted. Uh, John Russell played that as well as you can. You're free safety, you stay deep. Very deep. There's no reason for you to come up, particularly when you have a 20-point lead. And so he's waiting back there, and he had plenty of time to make this play. And this was the big stick, the big play call for Middle Tennessee. Uh, a wide receiver pass from a left-handed wide receiver. Normally, halfback passes or wide receiver passes go to the right because most guys are right-handed. You just don't expect that coming the other direction. And it didn't work. Well, you know, the rule of thumb is you have to run your trick plays before the other guy, and you have to run them early. Play fake for Cantwell. Got Barnage deep. And it's just under thrown and incomplete with a flag down. Broken up by Dana Stewart. Guys, are you surprised that the starters for Louisville are still on the field at this stage of the game in offense? Well, not, not really. <laughs> well, me neither, Rob, but why not? Well, I, I think they've struggled enough tonight to where um, Petrino wants to see some rhythm, and he wants to do that. And also... He doesn't believe in taking his guys out early. Now, I thought this ball was uncatchable, which was why I was surprised that they threw the flag there. During the play, pass interference. Number 32 on the defense. 15 yards in the biggest spot. Touchdown. Regardless of whether it was catchable, I was at a penalty. Uh, I think the official, the official was thinking he was face guarding him, but that ball was underthrown and hit him in the back before he even got to the receiver. I, I think that's... Still, the penalty yards much improved under Rick Stock still in his first year. One of the major changes. We talked about the academic progress at Middle Tennessee during his watch. Only one player under a 2.0 after three-fourths of the team last year was under a 2.0. Here's a running play on first down to Anthony Allen, a true freshman. He picks up the first down of the 18, got 11. 
Well, I agree with you about the starters of Louisville being out there. Next week, Louisville has their Big East opener against Cincinnati. Then they have the big showdown at home against West Virginia. After that, it's ranked Rutgers. If you can't sleep on Rutgers, they're having a fabulous year. And if this offense isn't clicking on all cylinders, Bobby Petrino wants to leave it out there until it does. Now, the risk he has is every time you throw the ball, you're putting your quarterback in harm's way, and you don't have Brian Brown back yet. Allen trying to get to the outside and flags down. Face mask. Trevor Jenkins grabbed the mask of Anthony Allen. Now we mentioned the fact that Brown is out. Michael Bush is also out. Bush done for the year, though, with a broken leg. And, and Trevor, I think this would be an appropriate time to start looking at getting in your backup quarterback, Patrick Carter, to get him some reps just in case you don't get Brown back when you think you will and in case something happens to Hunter Cantwell. So you have the holding on Louisville and then the personal foul face mask on Middle Tennessee. There's Patrick Carter, who is a return punts and also played a little bit of receiver tonight, but no quarterback yet. There's Clearly a 15, mask, 15 yards. During the play, holding on the offense, number 79. Personal foul on the defense. Bobby Petrino asking where did the holding penalty come from? Let's show you. On the right side of your screen, right up there. That was a little uh, iffy there. Kurt Quarterman, the right guard, gets called for holding, but again, the play's offset. From the 18-yard line of Middle Tennessee. Play action. Cantwell. And it is dropped. Wide open at the five-yard line with Scott Coon who scored a touchdown earlier in the contest. Couldn't hang on to it there. And he was thinking about that second touchdown. And he turned to go. No one was there to hit him. And he started thinking about getting into the end zone before he had control of the ball. So unhappy Bobby Petrino was. Oh, watch me. He gets excited right now. Oh, my goodness. I can go. I can go. Oh, no, you can't. Clearly an incompletion. Did not have possession. Only one touchdown and four red zone possessions. Another thing that uh, Petrino, I'm sure, will talk about with the team this week as they get ready for Cincinnati to open the Big East next weekend as Anthony Allen takes it to the 10 for eight yards. We've talked about how fiery he gets when the players aren't performing. And, and Rod, you mentioned something that's very important, that he also knows, though, which players he can get in their face and which players he needs to be more gentle with. One of the great things that Bobby Petrino has done is develop the recruits that he's got. He's got tremendous depth. He's recruited so well. But each individual player is giving his very best performance. And Petrino is the one that draws that out. Third down and two from the 10. Colby Smith straight ahead to the five. Touchdown, Louisville. Rushing touchdown this year for Louisville. That's tops in the country and fourth of the season for Smith. Right here, keep your eyes on the left side of that offensive line. They make most of their good yardage over there. Look at that huge hole that they created for Smith. PAT for Carmody. And it's 37 to 10. 34 unanswered Louisville points. We're in Denver at 8.30 Eastern on ESPN's Monday Night Football. Steve McNair in his first year with the Ravens used to play here as a member of the Tennessee Titans. And Bobby Petrino coached the quarterback for the other team, the Denver Broncos, Jake Plummer. When Plummer was at Arizona State, Petrino was the quarterback's coach. 37 to 10 Louisville Cardinals have really picked it up since their special teams got them into some trouble and they trailed 10 to 3 in the first quarter. Well, even though the Louisville offense has been spotty, their defense hasn't. I mean, their defense has been everything we thought it would be based on their performance 
during the first uh, four games of the season. Colby Smith filling in for the injured Michael Bush with his fourth rushing touchdown, even with Bush's injury. Louisville leads the country in rushing TDs. Bush led the nation in scoring in 2005. And they kick off from the 20 after a penalty on the extra point. Another flag down on the kick. Nixon with it at the 25. Reverses field. Spins out of a tackle in the 30 and finally down at the 35-yard line. Tackled by Stephen Garr. Again, a penalty flag on the play. Back at the 22-yard line. Now the dreaded re-kick for a special teams player. Let's check in with Heather for more. I'll do that after this call. On the kicking team, number 23, five yards, repeat the kick. All right, Heather, take it away. Actually, we'll go back up for the kick, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about Michael Bush and his NFL draft status. All right, Michael Bush in attendance for this game, did make the trip, broke his leg against Kentucky, is a senior, and could elect to... Uh, Come back to Louisville. And he's in the press box. That's Michael Bush. Well, he's not looking down on the field. Who's he looking for? Faith Hill up there. Maybe. <laughs> well, he's, uh, he's actually using kind of a, a cane or crutch. We saw him before the ball game as he got off the bus and chatted with folks, taking pictures with a lot of the cheerleaders. He's still very popular. And he should be. The, the thing everybody says about him is that all his career, he has done what's best for the Louisville football program, never himself. Louisville kicking off from the 15. Don't see that very often. They keep kicking it to Nixon. He's burned him a couple of times. Can't get to the outside this time. Planet at the 42. All right, down to Heather Cox now with a Michael Bush story. Hey, guys. Now, according to the scouts of three different NFL teams, the belief is that if Michael Bush declares himself eligible for the draft, he'll fall anywhere between 20th and 40th, so either low first round or high second round. Now, there's lots of variables. The pluses, they say, he's got great hands, can catch the ball well. The concern, of course, that broken leg, especially considering it's on a weight-bearing bone, they think it'll take longer to heal. Others mentioned that his running style could be an issue because he runs high he could be more prone to injury which guys begs the question should he or should he not declare himself eligible for the draft this year now we'll get to the take after this first down play hand off to gross for the 43 or 45 rather 43 yards well i think if he does come back it should be on the condition that he moves to tight end i think he projects better as an h-back or a tight end in the nfl because of that running style he isn't the kind of upright runner like an Eric Dickerson who's slippery and is hard to get a direct hit on. He relishes the contact. Well, that's fine against the Cincinnati Bearcats, but against the Cincinnati Bengals, that'll get you nailed. And an injured uh, player, Willie Williams, is down for Louisville. Well, you'd have to think, since Bush did play a little tight end uh, earlier in his career at Louisville, that the best place for him to be to help Louisville win is at running back. So you wonder if Petrina would move him to tight end if he felt that uh, that's where he was uh, best projected for the next level. Well, I personally would like to see him come back for a couple of reasons. I think he's great for college football, but I also just think it's probably in his own best interest physically and mentally. It's going to take him a while to come back from that broken leg as you see Williams head to the sideline. That was a pretty severe break that he had, and it's going to take a long time to get physically back to where he was, and then mentally, you just got to get over having gone through that. Well, remember Willis McGahee a few years ago against Ohio State in the uh, final game, hurt his leg and ended up being a first-round draft pick, even though he was not able to play that year. Second down and seven at the 45. Luke Pascal on the catch at the 47-yard line, and he's got the first down. Bush has certainly done an awful lot while he's been at Louisville, rushing for over 2,500 yards, 39 touchdowns, and I think he probably would have had, oh, 25 or 30 touchdowns this year had he been healthy. And I understand that Bobby Petrino is going to make sure that he puts Michael Bush in touch with some NFL 
general managers who can give him a straight scoop on where he's likely to go in the draft so he can make a good decision about whether to come back next season. There's not a lot of 250-pound NFL running backs that have success over a long period of time. Jamal Lewis would be one that comes to mind as DeMarco McNair is taken down after a one-yard game. Back down to Heather Cox. I was able to talk to Michael Bush before the game. He's one month into what they think will be six months of rehab. He did have a titanium rod and two screws put in that leg. He just started riding the bike last week. His goal, if his doctors will let him, is to actually lead the team out, run onto the field November 2nd for that big matchup against West Virginia. Now, when I asked him about his decision on whether or not he'd return to Louisville or declare himself eligible, he said it's way too early. I'm waiting till the end of that six months rehab to even start thinking about a decision there. I would think he'll get good advice from this man. Please reset the clock to 751. One reason that Bobby Petrino is able to recruit so well is that it's very clear to everybody that he had comes in contact with that he cares about his players. That's one of the reasons he gets so much production from his players, so much preparation. And that extends now to Michael Bush. And if Bobby Petrino believes that it's best for Michael Bush to leave, he will tell him and he will help him. Heather mentioned... Uh some scouts saying anywhere from 20 to 40. Another scouting service has him as the first day pick, but not necessarily in the top 40, as McNair takes it to the 41 for five yards. A first day pick means one of the first to three rounds. Upended by Adrian. As we're talking about the upright running style of Michael Bush. And he's got speed. He runs a little bit faster than a 4640, and for a man his size at 250 pounds, that's huge. Well, you, you can see how so many NFL scouts and general managers would get really enthusiastic about the notion of using him as an H-back or in a two-tight end set as more NFL teams are starting to use that formation now. They're down in three from Middle Tennessee at the 41. Play fake for Marks. And dumps it off to Porter for the first down of the 35. Heather mentioned that Bush would love to run out on the field before that game against West Virginia on November 2nd. Okay, you guys have had some time to take in what you've seen tonight from Louisville. We've watched West Virginia on television. We've got them on Friday night in a couple of weeks. Who's the better football team right now, guys? Louisville the West Virginia? Well, I, I think that at some point, not having Michael Bush and not having Brian Brown will catch up with you as you compare these two teams. I think West Virginia has a slight edge uh, with Brown in there. I think they have a bigger edge with Brown out. Michael Bush obviously not going to play in that game, but uh, Brown should return a quarterback by then. Desmond G in the game at running back. They hand it to him on first down. Stacked up at the 33-yard line. Two yards on the play. Well, Louisville and West Virginia played a tremendous game last year. A touchdown for Michael Bush, and Louisville led big in the fourth quarter, but Slayton, Pat White, and the rest of the Mountaineers came back, eventually won that game in triple overtime. What a game that was in Morgantown a year ago. This year, it'll be played at Papa John Stadium in Louisville. And that's an important factor. That is the one thing that would really help Louisville. Marks rolling right, and he's a left-handed passer, and off target with that throw intended for Grigsby. Rod, you're right about that, because it's not who's the better team, it's who's the better team on the field they'll be playing on. And they're playing at Louisville, and I think Louisville's defense, actually, with all the offensive fireworks the Cardinals are known for, West Virginia also has a spectacular offense, but I think Louisville's defense is clearly ahead of West Virginia's defense right now, and because of the combination of that and the home field, I give the edge ever so slightly to Louisville. That's good, good stuff. I mean, that point about the Louisville defense, I think, is a very good one. Not only uh, loss when... Louisville scores 40-plus under Petrino was against West Virginia last year. Petrino also talked to Pittsburgh when we talked to him this week. Louisville will have Middle to play Tennessee. at Pitt on November 25th. They'll also play Rutgers on November 9th. And uh, those four Big East teams, Louisville, West Virginia, Pittsburgh, and Rutgers, in the top 12 in the NCAA in scoring differential. Here, it's a 27-point difference. Louisville leading.
things started well for Middle Tennessee. The game was tied at 10 after one, but it's been all Louisville since. 34 unanswered Cardinal points. How about the Louisville defense? Over the last 16 plus quarters, the defense has given up only one touchdown and three field goals. The lone touchdown for the Blue Raiders tonight was on special teams. So 16 points in the last 16 quarters allowed by the Louisville defense. Marks in the shotgun on third down and eight from the Louisville 33. Whitehead bats it into the air. G catches it anyway, but well short of the first down tackle at the 39. Tomorrow night, college football primetime at ESPN at 745. Tennessee and Georgia. And an SEC showdown. A Tennessee loss probably eliminates, eliminates the balls from SEC Eastern Division Championships. Georgia 4-1 and one under Mark Rick against Tennessee. You have to wonder, where will the points come from for Georgia? They've really struggled offensively. Tereshink, see, is he back? Is he ready to go? Only uh, his fourth career start, if he indeed does start tomorrow night. Not a lot of experience at the quarterback position for Georgia. Middle Tennessee is going to go for it on fourth down. A couple of big games in the timeout. SEC tomorrow. Middle Tennessee, their second charge timeout of half. LSU in Florida is the other big SEC game, and it begs the question, who's number two right now in college football? Ohio State obviously number one, but who's the second best team in the land? We'll talk about that when we get back. Back in Nashville, where Louisville has a 37-10 lead over Middle Tennessee, looking for its first 5-0 start since 1993, trying to stop Middle Tennessee on 4th and 14. Marks gets away from Malik Jackson and finds G for a first down inside the 20 to the 19-yard line. Now just moments ago, Michael Bush, who is out for the season with a broken leg, left the press box and made his way down to the Louisville sideline and a standing elevation for the senior running back. Almost as much as getting a million dollars. Bernard, you mentioned that's a great picture. That he's good for college football. He is not just because of his talent, but he's got the kind of character that college football represents. Mark's going to the end zone, and Teron Henry had no idea where the ball was. Boy, it could hit him on the back of the foot. And Henry got turned around. He was looking for the ball over his inside shoulder, and it comes over the outside shoulder. Take a look here. He looks, he looks, he looks back, and it's on the outside. Well, Middle Tennessee now is fighting for pride. They know they're not going to win this game, but Clint Marks is fired up. He's the leader of this team. They're undefeated in conference play, and a strong finish here, not quitting here, sets them up for the continuation of their conference season. That win over North Texas State last week was a big win for them, put them at 2-0. They're in good shape in their conference. They're in the Sun Belt, and the Sun Belt champion goes to the New Orleans Bowl. Here's G around the end of the 10-yard line and pushed out there. Keep in mind that Desmond G is a true freshman. He's 5'8", 163 pounds, but he is so quick, and he has got a great future here at Middle Tennessee. A little bit uh, like uh, Garrett Wolf in terms of uh, stature. Nicknamed Ping Pong. I tell you, Garrett Wolf, boy, he's putting up some numbers. Well, look how little G is in front of all those other guys. <laughs> Down and two. G ping pongs past the marker to about the seven yard line. Now guys, we talked before the break about some great games in the SEC tomorrow with Tennessee, Georgia, LSU, Florida. Auburn plays uh, Arkansas. Auburn currently number two. USC is ranked third. Plays Washington. Huskies off to a great start. Michigan ranked in the top ten. Plays Michigan State. Ohio State clearly number one after what we saw last week against Iowa. But who's number two? I want to get uh, your guys' take on that. After this play, first down and goal at the eight-yard line. Shotgun for Marks. 
Marks feeling the pressure. Finds Chicola, and he is in. Touchdown, Middle Tennessee. First offensive touchdown of the night for Middle Tennessee. Yeah, and Marks has done a nice job on this drive of showing some mobility and making the play under duress. The blitz came in, he evaded it, and he made a nice throw. That's still primarily the first team defense out there for Louisville. Colby Smith with the extra point, and it's 37 to 17. Finally, some points for Middle Tennessee after 34 in a row by Louisville. And this is what we're talking about, how good this is for Middle Tennessee. I mean, winning or, or, or losing to the Cardinals tonight, I mean, winning would be huge. But it has nothing to do with their conference schedule. Their first goal is to win the Sun Belt. And Marks, under pressure, delivers a ball to his tight end, Chicola, in perfect stride. So Chicola can keep running at full speed and break this tackle. If Chicola has to stop, then he'll probably get dragged down by the starting cornerback, William Gay. So this bodes well for the confidence of this Middle Tennessee team as they move into their conference schedule. I think it bodes well for the confidence for Clint Marks. I mean, that play, he had a blitz coming right up the middle in his face and then one coming off the corner, and he still managed to keep his composure and find his receiver quarter out there, I'm sorry, Chicola out there for the touchdown. That's great. Louisville might be dominating the scoreboard and total offense, but a good showing by Middle Tennessee tonight to be down only 20 to the team that leads the nation in scoring and is eighth in the country in scoring defense. Well, I'll tell you, the, the defense, the run defense especially of Middle Tennessee has impressed me tonight. Louisville has had their big plays from the passing game, but in the yards per carry, they're down from their average. Even Adrian Peterson. They held him to 4.7 yards per carry, the only team this year to hold him to less than 5.2, Middle Tennessee. I'm going to try the onside kick. Colby Smith. Barnage for Louisville pulls it down at midfield. So Louisville will take over at the 50-yard line. Well, we were talking before about who just is number two in the nation behind Ohio State. The All-State standing show that Auburn is number two right now. You get USC, West Virginia, Louisville at number eight. Ohio State clearly, guys, after the win over Iowa, number one in the country, but a little bit cloudy after that, don't you think? Yeah, I, I, Ohio State is clearly number one. I would say that, you know, in my view, it would be USC, Auburn, and Michigan as, as the three teams that have the the best claim to being number two because of strength of schedule and because of how good their defenses are. Running play to Bolin on first down to the 47-yard line. Tackled by Trevor Jenkins. Trevor Maddox, what do you think about who's number two? You know, to me, it's very close. I've got tremendous respect for Pete Carroll reloading, not just on the personnel side, but also offensive coordinator uh, and all the coaching changes they have there. But I, I would have to say Auburn right now is the best or second best team in the country. Uh, I like what Brandon Cox and Kenny Irons are doing at quarterback and running back. Their defense is third in the nation in scoring defense, and, and their schedule really shapes up for them to sweep and go undefeated this year. Now, based on what I saw against the South Carolina, I went with uh, Michigan, West Virginia, and USC is the, the best three teams in terms of fighting for that number two spot as Anthony Allen takes it to the 37 yard line. You know, the interesting thing is that if you look at Louisville and West Virginia, in order for one of these two teams to move up to number two, it's sort of out of their control. And they can run the table, but so long as Michigan, USC, Auburn are in the mix up there, they probably will not jump them. It'd be tough if Louisville goes undefeated to play for the national championship game with all those teams ahead of them, even if some of those teams have one loss, right. depending on who they lose to. And, and that's going to be because of strength of schedule and then also the, the perception of voters is as to you know, USC, Ohio State, and the others being stronger. Anthony Allen inside the 20 to the 18, tackled by Nixon. We look at Auburn. They've got a tough one against Arkansas tomorrow. 
But they have they played LSU at home. As you look at Louisville, they're number eight. Auburn plays Florida and Georgia at home still. They miss Tennessee. If Auburn sweeps and wins the SEC, goes undefeated, and doesn't play in the national championship game again, boy, will there be a firestorm. Tommy Tupperville, the Auburn head coach, very vocal this week about his desire to see a playoff. In part because he probably looks at the big picture and says it might be tough for us to get back or to be in the position again to play for a national championship after missing out a couple of years ago. Well, you know, it's not like the SEC is barred from that game. They've, they've done okay by it. LSU won the national championship just a couple of years ago, and you know they've been pretty well represented over the last few years. On second down, it's Anthony Allen again. And he's to the 16-yard line. Tuberville's got a good point, though, because he's saying that the conference is so tough. You know, four teams in the top ten at the same time this season that the best team in the nation might be there and still lose a game and not be in the top two BCS rankings at the end because of that one loss to a great team. You know what? It's early. No need to cry. Play out the season. See where it is. And go from there. You know, what's all this? It's just October. We just barely got into the month. Hand off to Allen again on third down. Breaks a tackle at the 10. Touchdown, Louisville. Sixteen yard scamper, second touchdown this year for true freshman Anthony Allen. We talk about the recruiting of Bobby Petrino. He can lose Bush. He can lose Braun early in the third quarter of the Miami game and still dominate and still have the best scoring offense in the country. You know, Trevor, what's interesting about that is that they're now getting guys at Louisville who say no to places like Auburn and Alabama and Notre Dame, and they come to Louisville instead. And Brian Brown said no to Notre Dame and Tennessee. And you have Keenan Whitehead, true freshman defensive end, one of the top recruits ever at Louisville, said no to both Alabama and Auburn. He's from Birmingham, ends up at Louisville. And that kid right there, Anthony Allen, pretty good one too. Big kid, 6'1", 225 pounds, and he's from Tampa. Turning down uh, a lot of major programs in Florida to come play running back at Louisville. 44 points tonight for Louisville, right at its average. The nation's leaders, leader in scoring, but they got those 44 the hard way. They definitely earned those 44 tonight. Now they weren't a they weren't very happy over on that sideline after the first quarter and midway through the second quarter. You know, credit though, Middle Tennessee. This defense, even though it's a Sun Belt team and they've been down for a while, as we look at Peanut Whitehead, Middle Tennessee is a much more spirited team than people know. The numbers for Kentwell tonight, more touchdown passes in this game than he had total this season. Could it be his last start? Will Brian Brom return to play Cincinnati next weekend? Brom expected to throw a football Sunday. Hurt his thumb against Miami. Well, here we are, late in the fourth quarter. 44 points, and who directed that drive but Cantwell? They didn't put Pat Carter in. They wanted Cantwell to make sure that he got as much experience and as much improvement in running the operation of the offense as they could. If I were a betting man, I would bet that Brian Brom is going to play next week, and that's just based on talking to him before the ball game. He's so antsy. He said he's had enough of this sitting out and the like. He wants to get back in there. The two injuries in the last 12 months, that major knee injury at the end of last year, and now the thumb. Nixon on the return, and make that G on the return, past the 40 to the 42-yard line. <laughs> Campbell had a lot of success because of Mario Yerudi, a six-foot-six wide receiver, two touchdown catches tonight. And he was a guy that really turned the game around for Louisville. When they were down 10 to three, he made the big play, a 68-yard touchdown catch and run, and then right before the half, really put the nail in the coffin by coming up with this touchdown pass that put them up by 13 points and kind of said goodnight to Middle Tennessee at that point. Backup quarterback Joe Craddock into the game for Middle Tennessee for what's probably the final play. And a bad snap. 
Craddock falls on it, and that will likely end the game. 134 yards receiving for Yerudia, and that catch at the end of the half was what did in Middle Tennessee. Bobby Petrino for the first time as head coach of the local Cardinals off to a 5-0 start. They remain unbeaten as they get ready for Big East play. Final score, 44-17. Louisville. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. Rod Gilmore, Trevor Maddich, Heather Cox, our entire crew. I'm Dave Pash. Quite frankly, coming up next with Stephen A. Smith. Post-game coverage from our game on ESPN News.